Salt Lake City. We are here on Tuesday, February 21st, at the beginning of our work session. Um, welcome to today's city council meeting. We continue to post hybrid meetings to keep everyone healthy and safe. Our meetings are public and you are welcome to join us in person or by watching from the council's agenda page, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us in whichever manner you feel most comfortable. Comfortable. There is a work session meeting during which there, to this right now is a work session meeting during which there's no public comment, but join us tonight at 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. And as, of course, we always welcome your feedback anytime by mail to P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114, or by email at council.comments at slcgov.com or via our 24-hour phone comment line, 801-535-7654. Written comments we receive on agenda-related topics are shared with council members and posted to our website, slccouncil.com. Uh, and just a note about tonight's formal meeting, we are still planning to have that hybrid, but encourage anyone who doesn't feel safe with the snow to tune in virtually. We'll make sure that the virtual option is um, robust as possible. That's true, right? Okay. Um, okay, so the first item on our agenda is informational updates from the administration. We have, I think, Lindsay or that's the only person I see at your table. Oh, Ashley and Andrew Johnston. And as they're getting started, hi, Ashley, I love your shirt. As, as they're getting ready, just uh, there are going to be a couple things that move around in order today based on things that have come up. Go ahead, Ashley. Okay, well, lovely. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy end of All-Star Weekend. Woohoo! Um, I am here to give some community engagement highlights for today. Next slide, please. Okay, um, as always, community members, please, please, please visit slc.gov forward slash feedback forward slash for all things regarding civic engagement and community outreach. Um, it is pretty quiet these days because it is so cold outside and a lot of our community outreach and community engagement happen during very warm summer times. But as of right now, next slide. Our sustainability office is uh, running the Resident Food Equity Advisors Program. It's a resident leadership and engagement initiative focused on creating an equitable community food system. Thank you. <laughs> the advisors asked the sustainability department to launch a food equity micro grant. That program is up and running and still accepting individual and organizational applications through March 6th. Individuals can apply for grants of $250 to support home food productions, and organizations can apply for up to $5,000. There is an informational workshop at Day Riverside Library, February 23rd, in two days, from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. It is kid-friendly, uh, to provide an overview and answer questions. We appreciate help um, sharing the grant, so please let your neighbors know about it. Please get it out into your newsletters and visit slc.gov forward slash sustainability forward slash food equity grant for more information. Um, from the mayor's office specifically, we have our art healing comment form from all the engagement regarding the families at Fleet Block that can also be found at the slc.gov forward slash feedback page. And it's pretty much just to let the community know how the engagement went over the past um, nine months or so, remind them that the sign is up, and to see if they have any opinions just based on the whole art healing segment. Um, over the next couple of months, um, we'll also be hosting indigenous and Native American working groups to take some of those policies that we brought to you last week forward. We'll be looking at land acknowledgements and things of that nature. If anyone would like more information on what we're doing um, in regards to indigenous and Native American relationships, 
um, citywide, uh, please visit the uh, slc.gov forward slash mayor webpage and look at the community outreach page. Um, this Thursday, the 24th, our office will also be hosting Proclamation Plus. Uh, Proclamation Plus is, uh, you know, an effort to hopefully get more of our constituents and community leaders engaged in what the city is doing and making sure those relationships are um, cyclical, I guess you could say. We host something called the um, community council quarterly meeting every couple of months. So we are doing the same thing for underrepresented communities when they have a holiday or proclamation by hosting a larger community-wide meeting afterwards. Um, this next one will be um, at Calvary Baptist Church on Thursday the 23rd from 9 to 12. And then lastly, um, our community office hours are still going strong. Um, I'm excited to see that we have more people coming to find them as um, they're becoming more of an expectation in the community. Um, we have one, uh, we have a couple today actually at Roots Coffee and the Patagonia Outlet. And then we also have two more on the 23rd. Um, if anyone wants to be updated on our community office hours going forward, we also have a plug on Instagram going. We have a little chart there every month. And then you can also, of course, visit slc.gov forward slash mayor and look at our community outreach page. And that's all I have. Thank you, Ashley. Looks like Andrew Johnston, Director of Homelessness Policy and Outreach, is next. You get next slide. Oh, perfect. You can see the numbers for last week at the uh, resource centers and the overflow. Uh, still high, high utilization rate. There was an exception to a, a St. Vinny's downtown, um, which was below average for some reason. We're still trying to figure out why that was over the weekend. It may have been just be the, the crowds down there and a little bit of deterrence. Um, but the good news with this, I'll, I'll say again, is that the coordinated entry process and the coordination between the facilities and the transportation is working well to get people where they need to be every night. Um, so uh, we'll make sure that we're aware of that. Second part there is rapid intervention or encampment impact mitigation work. Uh, due to the weather, um, both tonight and tomorrow, they're going to not um, do some impact mitigation work this week in various locations, probably follow up next week as soon as possible once the weather sort of settles down. Um, you can see the rapid intervention team locations have increased since last week, uh, more outreach to more locations. And then the next resource fair is in uh, several weeks from now. Next slide. This is something that you saw last week in a different format. Uh, I apologize I was remote last week and it didn't uh, look as good as it should have. Uh, I wanted to make sure that you saw this again in a different way. This is the Miami model or sequential intercept. What you'll see here are uh, essentially six different intercept levels in the community. And this is a national um, concept that's been around for quite a while. In the blue, you'll see that we actually, in this county, have a lot of programs that fit different levels here, already existing. And so from the intercept zero down to five, you'll see intercept zero are things that can be voluntarily accessed by anybody in the community in a real preventative way, um, including right now the VOA detox, which you're aware of, but the crisis phone line, the mobile um, crisis outreach teams, the receiving center, which is being built right now, anybody can go there anytime when they're in need especially when we get the expanded receiving center. If you go to intercept one, that's more when law enforcement gets involved. And we talk a lot about that here because um, as a provider of law enforcement services, the city has some responsibility here. And you as a council and the mayor and the city over time has done a number of things like the social workers and the community connection center, um, trying to make sure that all officers are CIT trained, crisis intervention trained, and then certified as well and increasing the number of folks that are certified. These are things that are probably within the city's um, purview in a lot of ways. Now, if you go to intercept two, you'll see that that's where you'll get more of the initial detention stuff. When an officer intervenes in a situation and they need to take them to the jail, for instance, for some reason, there's also an opportunity there to divert out of the criminal justice system into other services. And that could be treatment services in the jail, but also community response teams, pretrial services, which handles a lot of releases from jail early on. We saw in Miami, they do actually assessments immediately upon entry into jail. And if they're um, in need of 
mental health treatment particularly, divert them out of the jail immediately to another facility, all right? Um, if you see number three, that's where you have specialty courts, case coordination coordinators in those courts, drug court, mental health court, veterans court, all those kind of things. And as we have a justice court in the city, this is also a place where the city could have some, um, some say and do some work in this, this realm. Now, if you look at intercept four, and you'll see that's when reentry back out because everybody that goes into the county jail comes back out again sooner or later, right? And we got to have ways to think through what's that exit look like? Where do they go? How do we follow up with people who are on long-term probation and parole or just have the same needs they had when they went in? Homeless, experiencing homelessness, experiencing chronic mental illness or substance use issues, uh, physical health issues, whatever it is. And the intercept five is that longer-term work. Um, that's a lot of county work, particularly um, treatment providers, but also it's specialized housing. And this council's taken some steps to try and help fund um, housing that would fit some models like this, right? Uh, I think Denver Street in Salt Lake City is a good example of that in the last few years. Um, it works with the ACT team. It's very specific housing that's permanent supportive housing by definition, but is geared towards a, a population that would otherwise probably cycle in and out of treatment and or jail and those kind of things. So you can see there's a lot of work been done the last 10 years by the county in a lot of levels and the city working with them. What we're looking to do is make this broader to scale it to the scale we need in this county now and to add um, places where we have gaps. There may be gaps between these levels of intercept. There may be gaps within each of these where we don't have as many resources in certain areas. And so this is the work of that group now coming together to work on this model. Um, another update on that group is that the uh, County Justice Advisory Council, CJAC, is going to be taking the lead on this work. That's a good sign for us. Um, Mayor Mendenhall has been recently appointed to their board or will be appointed to their board. Um, having them take the lead is a good starting point to make sure there's still progress going forward and we're not going alone. We've talked about that multiple times before. Um, the other thing about this to remember is that sometimes when we get um, in the community and talking about some of the issues we're seeing on our streets with people who are um, clearly experiencing mental illness symptoms, crises, substance use, whatever it is, and oftentimes we're, we're struggling about do we leave them, do we get them into jail or just into treatment, right? And, and this gives a good example of how we have to have a lot of levels and a lot of ways to catch people all through the system. Um, so as simple as we want to make it and as simple as we need it to be for the public, we also know behind the scenes there's a lot that goes into this, which is why we're taking so much time working on this. And we can talk more about this as we go into the year, but I wanted to start again, and uh, repetition helps us to remember stuff, obviously, and get more detail. Um, but I wanted to put that in front of you again in a clearer way this week. I have one more update, if, unless you have some questions about this. I th think there is one question, Councilman Petro. Do you know yet if the intention is to just um, increase the capacity of the services that already exist, or are we going to also diversify services available within each of these intercepts potentially? Probably both, if I had to guess at this point, Council Member. Um, we have some good services that are clearly not big enough and broad enough, but we also know there are some gaps, um, things that we've seen elsewhere that could probably work here or things that we could expand here in a slightly different way. Um, I'll look at, um, I'll say intercept one with uh, the Unified uh, Police Departmental Health Unit and our Salt Lake City social workers. We know there's not enough of those, right? Um, but we also know that Unified may be looking differently <laughs> in times to come. And if we have a lot of individual police departments to work through, you know how big this becomes. Another example might be that uh, Miami had up front a very clear memorandum of understanding with hospitals to provide certain psychiatric um, services within seven days of seeing them. That's something that we probably don't have here in that same way yet, and we may want to prove that or increase that or add that at all. Yeah. Council Member Dugan. Thank you, Andrew. And I, I love that explanation of working all through these intercepts and the tie-in from Salt Lake City, what we have been developing over the number of years in the Miami project, and we realize that We've, we've done a lot of work. They just had a more robust program than we have here now. And I really appreciate the uh, outwork that we've, the, the work we've been doing on this. And, and I'm glad that we have a good uh, base that we can expand on without having to reinvent the whole wheel. So kudos to the whole team on this uh, project. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, we'll keep you updated. The last thing, uh, Mr. Chair, is um, House Bill 499 came out the end of last week, which is the big sort of bill on homelessness services that we've been anticipating this year. It takes, um, last year we had House Bill 440, which laid out the overflow process about how to find overflow beds, 
for this winter. Um, this is the follow-up to that bill, and we are still going through it internally in the city and also with the League of Cities and Towns. There's a meeting tomorrow with the League and various city members, um, and working with Wayne Niederhauser of the state uh, about how to um, improve that process and also make sure that we have enough resources for everybody who needs it going into next year. So we'll have more updates on that coming forward very quickly. Thank you, Andrew. Council members, any other questions for Andrew? <coughs> All right, thank you. So we're moving on to item number two, which is the North Point Small Area Plan, just to give a little preview of where we're headed. Um, item number three, which was originally the Glendale Regional Park Plan, is not able to happen today due to a staff member's um, family emergency so we are cutting that and in its place we're going to move item number seven the water and snowpack report so that the items further down on the agenda don't have to be moved quite as much hopefully that will only require one set of people to come and move rather than everybody so um, so that's where we'll we'll head after this but go ahead um, the at the table oh, sorry at the table we have Nick Tarbett council policy analyst Chrissy Gilmore senior planner Looks like Kelsey Lindquist is available, and then Nick Norris, planning director, is at the table as well. Nick, do you want to start with a sure. introduction? I'll give a real high-level introduction so Kelsey has all the fun details to share. The North Point Small Area Plan is, the, is a land use plan for the area located between the Salt Lake City International Airport, the northern boundary of the city, along tr and along the 2200 West Corridor. This is a council-initiated petition. Uh, in 2020, the council allocated $100,000 to update this small area plan for this area of the city. With that, I'll let Chrissy take over. Great, thank you. Well, th good afternoon. Um, we can go to the next slide, but Nick just covered the project location, and I, um, but I did want to throw it on the screen for context because I know there's a lot of people tuning in that are interested. Um, so this is in the northwest corner of the city, bound by the Great Salt Lake, to the west, the airport, and then we have I-215 and the Jordan River. Um, the last time that we met with you was in September. It was the, the end of September we gave a briefing. That was right before the Planning Commission public hearing in October. Um, since that time, a few changes have been made to the plan that I will try to touch on th as we go through the presentation and um, bring you up to speed on those. So next slide. And then for context, just as far as the current zoning goes, um, a good portion of the area is zoned business park, that is the blue, BP, and then the area that's in Salt Lake County is zoned um, AG2, Agriculture 2, or 5 actually, I think that, or 2, and then we have Salt Lake City property that is also AG2. At the very bottom of the project area on that little um, finger is um, light manufacturing, which is M1. And then this other map on the screen you can see is the existing future land use map from the current North Point small area plan that shows um, pretty much everything west of 2200 West as business park. And then you'll see this area on the east side as um, AG2 or AG5. All right, next slide. And then next one. <laughs> So goals of the plan, um, this is really turned into highlights of the plan. These were the goals that the council directed staff to consider as the RFP was initiated. And these include things like, we wanted the plan to recognize the intense development pressure that the area is under and also be re realistic about that development pressure. Um, the plan was also directed to identify appropriate land use, future land use categories and development ca characteristics that could coexist with conflicting land uses, such as the existing agricultural and residential properties and also um, already approved and planned light manufacturing properties. Then we were also directed to look at ways to reduce impacts on, the, on wildlife, the environment, um, look at you know, air quality, water quality, and noise mitigation measures, as well as address future annexation potential for the area. Next slide. So as far as the vision map, this really hasn't changed since the last time you saw this map, but it includes four land use categories. We have natural open space, which is that green, and this is largely wetlands, and then it goes beyond the wetlands to that darker green um, to try and attempt to connect and not fragment those wetland areas. Then we have this transitional area, and that is that area largely um, east of 2200 West that we're anticipating is gonna transition from agricultural and residential properties to um, light manufacturing in the future. We don't see any new residential properties being approved in this area in the future, although those property owners have indicated that they do wish to stay in the area. This 
this particular land use category attempts to mitigate those existing residences from the impacts of new development, which will likely be light manufacturing. And then we have this business park and industrial category, which is the gray, um, and then airport properties. And these are properties that are owned by the airport, and they've indicated they have no plans to develop them and would like them to um, stay airport owned and be able to use them as they need for airport infrastructure. Next slide. Um, as far as design standards, so the plan is set up to include design standards for each of those land use categories. Um, so general design standards include buffering and setbacks from existing um, residential uses, wildlife and wetland habitat. So you can see there is um, a 300, up to 300 feet buffer from designated wetlands. We have canals and drains at 75 feet, um, the Jordan River at 100 feet, which that is the existing buffer already. We're just maintaining that buffer of 100 feet. Um, and then a 65 foot buffer from existing residential uses. So the, you can see this chart set up with business park and industrial land use and then transitional. So in that transitional zone, those smaller buffers are intended for development that comes in under the existing zoning. So if any new residential came in under the existing zoning, but if something was to come in under light manufacturing, they would be subject to those higher buffers um, in that business park and industrial category. Then we also have a maximum building frontage along 2200 west of either 400 feet or 250 feet, depending on which um, land use category you're in. Um, then the, the land use categories go from things like standards for new development. These include grading limitations, um, standards for fencing and walls, dark sky lighting. There's also visual design standards. Um, an example of those is a 100 foot uh, length of under uninterrupted material would be prohibited. So there would need to be breaks in material and things like uh, highly reflective glass would be prohibited. We also have water conscious development that talks about landscaping and stormwater management, as well as air, airport conflict mitigation. Um, this looks at primarily just noise and um, land use, ensuring that land uses are compatible with the airport. And then the transitional area has extra standards on top of that, which focus mostly on noise, um, odor and air quality, um, traffic and loading standards. And this is intended to really um, mitigate those impacts from on existing residential and agricultural properties. And then we also have standards for natural open space category. And these are largely things like planting, um, water uh, trails and boardwalks, and then um, stormwater policies, like making sure that water flowing into the Great Salt Lake is not obstructed. I think that's that on this slide, so next slide. And then implementation. So we have three critical implementation path items. These were identified to be the most important ones to um, really and get the vision of the plan as soon as possible. So the first one is looking at 2900 West and 2200 West redevelopment and construction and looking at funding tools to, um, to ensure that those roads are um, up to the vision of the plan and up to the standards identified. The next one is evaluate the feasibility of acquiring city-owned um, open space. Sorry, typo on that. Um, th this identifies land by the Jordan River and then wetlands adjacent to 3200 West and open land adjacent to 3200 West as priority areas for that um, acquisition. And the plan also has a toolkit that I'll talk about that gives various strategies for this action item like purchase of development rights, um, among other things. And then we have uh, development code updates. So these updates include just general development code updates. This would be things like looking at landscaping and prohibiting turf grass, um, looking at minimum lot areas in the M1 and BP zones to encourage clustering of development out of open space, and then also amending our lowland conservancy overlay zone to include that buffer for canals and drains. Then the plan, this is the probably the biggest change from the last time you saw the plan, is that the plan now recommends a North Point specific development code. And this really came about when we met with the planning commission, we realized that we had a list of changes that probably weren't appropriate citywide in the M1 zone, and they really were specific to the North Point area, and the North Point area was deserving of that specific code. So this would include, um, looking at ways to conserve. One of the biggest parts of this code would be looking at incentive-based tools to preserve open, open space. So that maximum building, front, building frontage along 2200 West, we could perhaps reduce that frontage um, in exchange for a greater open space preservation and um, looking at other tools like clustering. And then I think 
that is it for those three critical items. So we can go to the next slide. And then we have another list of other action items. These include require a local air utility plan. So right now, utility developers are required to provide a utility plan, but it's um, a smaller scope. This would really broaden the scope of that plan to look at more than just their specific property, but what would be needed as far as utilities go if the areas around them also develop, and they would be required to um, update the, the sewer and water capacity to, to service the anticipated growth of the area. Um, develop ev environmental impact standards, um, implement those wetland buffers. So another change from the last time you saw the plan was that the first draft of the plan just had a wetland buffer of 200 feet. That was up um, based on planning, con planning commission direction to 300 feet, but then we also modified the plan to say that we should look at a development framework that does priority wetland areas. So we could, if a wetland doesn't have, um, or if a wetland is very high priority, like it has habitat, like nesting birds, um, just um, different types of things, that would be a high priority wetland and we would look at you know, a scale and the higher priority wetlands would get that 300 foot buffer and then potentially they could have a reduced buffer if um, it's determined that it's not as high of a priority. And then support annexation of continu contiguous parcels in the project area. All right, next slide. And then the third, probably these are the last, last major change from the last time you saw the plan, is that we now include amend the major streets plan in the draft. Um, so there's three primarily, primary, primary roads that have been changed in this draft. So the first is 2900 West, which is a new north-south collector. Um, you probably are familiar with this road from the, is it Legacy Business Park? Is that the name of it? Leg Legacy Business Park subdivision. Um, so that's the one that just goes north to south down through the project area. Then 3200 West was, was um, changed from, so right now it's listed as a collector street on the major streets plan. We've downgraded that to a local street and also highlighted that it should remain unimproved, which means unpaved and a dirt road and then the airport road connecting to 2100 North. So I included this image on the map that shows, you can kind of see that the future airport plan shows that the runway is gonna be extended beyond 2100 North, so that road needs to be realigned to go around that um, extension of the airport. Right, next slide. And then the toolkit. So this is just a toolkit for various tools that the council can consider to implement these measures in the plan. And um, it's broken up into different preservation tools, so regulatory, incentive-based, and land acquisition tools, and then we also have financial tools that the council can consider. Next slide. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions and take feedback and direction. Thanks, Chrissy. Council members? Councilman Petro? I'll kick off. So I often joke that I only came here to do the hard things, and this small area is evidence that that is very true. Um, this is an area that possibly is suffering the worst from what happened during COVID. It was primed before COVID and then suffered from the inability to adapt quickly and kind of got sidebarred a little bit, and now we're behind the eight ball while development is happening out here. There are some of my constituents sitting here who have passionately, assertively, and kindly communicated with me the urgencies on these topics. And the truth is, um, you know, for me, I care about environment, but people are the reason that I'm here. And we are infringing on people. And this plan is an attempt at good faith development. It is true that when people sell their property out there, by and large, they're selling to commercial developers. There is an industrialization that is coming, and I'm really thankful to Chrissy and to Nick for trying to be as conscientious as they are in guiding us towards that industrialization with an eye towards protecting people and to protecting the ecosystem out there. We have to get really assertive, though. Right now, they're already, before I even got here, was an approved a million square foot warehouse that's going to be put in out there. And when that was approved, there were all sorts of concessions. For instance, they were not going to be going up and down 21, 22 West, which is actually a farm road. If you've ever been out to Cross E Ranch, it's that small farm road that has no sidewalks, no gutters, really nothing to speak for it. It's, it's a farm road. And currently, they're living 
with dust, PM 2.5, sound, and danger. As trucks are zooming up and down, we have document, documentation of this, video and photo. They have light pollution that shouldn't be there because the moment we allow for any sort of permissiveness in this area, it is the Wild West, and if you give an inch, a mile is taken. I hate business park zoning. I think business park is a relic of a time where we didn't have exclusively truck served warehouses that guarantee idling engines in windows, that didn't guarantee just an abject increase of traffic to the area, and didn't provide any well paying jobs. I would love to see the business park zoning abolished. Much to the chagrin of some of my constituents, I actually push for the M1 because at least it brings with it um, high caliber forward looking jobs. And if we are selective and careful in cultivating the developers who we allow in, and if we allow the incentive based things that we're talking about to take place, we can actually attract the caliber of businesses out there that we want. But I'm telling you in this area, an inch is a mile for anyone that we allow. And my constituents are the ones who are suffering mightily at the hands of it. Um, I'm gonna be taking up the 2200 West issue with anyone who will listen at this city to get it fixed. But it's exemplary of what we do here has to err on the side of protecting the people and the environment in which they live. Thank you, Councilmember Petro. Um, Council members, any other? Yes. Council member Dugan. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Council member Petro, for uh, that description of 2200 West. And uh, this is a great start to a plan, but I have a lot of concerns. And uh, starting with the, just the wording, uh, we have some really uh, nice words in here, but when they say it is encouraged, it uh, should be, uh, it should be flexible. Anytime we use that word in a development world, they're just gonna discount it because they're only f their first incentive is the profit, not the people and the planet. So they're always gonna be able to find ways to not do that because it's not gonna go on their bottom line. And I've been saying this for years that we gotta turn that dynamic around and start taking care of the people and the planet first and revenue will, uh, will, will gain from that, it won't be subtracted. It'll gain if we take care of those people on the planet first. So on the same vein of 2200 West, I'm worried about 3200 West and 2900 West. On the 3200 West, you know, reading through the dynamics here, it says 3200 is gonna stay unpaid, uh, right, undeveloped. Uh, but then there's one page 34 of the, uh, implementation plan that says uh, it is anticipated 3200 West will remain unimproved. And that word, un, uh, it is anticipated, means it can, it's gonna be paved to me, to the developer, because he's, he's got the opening there. And, and it should, and it should be, uh, development should be prohibited from facing 3200 West, should be. That again is open game for them to want to develop over there. And when I look at the maps and I look at the buffer zones and everything else, I really think anything west of 2,900 should be undeveloped. I know there's a, the, there's a Rudy Canal there, 75 feet on either side of the canal. I'm assuming that is also the right way. It's not 75 feet total, it's 75 feet on both sides of the high water mark. Um, we need to look at that. So there's a lot of words in here that I'm uh, concerned with that give it a developer an opening and we can't close the door after it's opened. Um, I like the, you know, the incentive-based uh, financial stuff is again nice, but only if they're gonna make a lot of money out of it. And so the, the, it needs to be a little bit more stronger there. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of uh, land swap, that's, that's the Dugan term, but it's probably a more technical term there. Uh, transfer development rights. Uh, I think that we should be exploring that from somewhere in the Northwest to areas that are already being developed with a lot of, uh, infrastructure already developed for them to, to use that area. And it might uh, behoove the city and it might behoove the area to also do that. So um, there's a number of other things here about the building facade. Again, hey, we'll let you have a bigger building facade if you give us a little land over here. Well, that huge 
long building facade doesn't really, you know, that, that again benefits them. Mm -hmm. Defining uh, limited distribution land, d uh, distribution land, and what that is. Every warehouse and every factory is a distribution because goods come in and goods have to leave, and so we need to really be clear on that definition also and try to um, again scale it back because this is our last area that we can really affect positive change because it has such an impact with the heartbeat of the Great Salt Lake of water going in and out and uh, the ecological concerns. So that's my pitch in the short. Thank, Thank you. you for all the work. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chrissy. Okay. Councilmember Wharton. Um, so I met with some, um, some residents that are um, concerned about the environmental impacts um, and asked about um, the like feasibility of a South Shore protection plan. Um, can you speak to why, uh, whether that would be feasible or is it, is it just not because of the, um, the ownership, the private ownership rights? Or so I think it probably depends on the extent of whatever that means, right? Um, some of that is probably land that's outside of Salt Lake City, and so it would require partnerships with those other government entities, whether it's Salt Lake County, if it extends further into Davis County, uh, other cities that may be in Davis County. So I think we'd have to understand the extent of that to understand what that means for Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, haven't seen any, I haven't seen that document, so I have no idea what they're. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think it's more of a concept um, as for, from what I understand, but um, do you think that, I mean, there's a combination of owners out there, some, some of it's Salt Lake City, some of it's the county, and some of it's private ownership, right? Um, and I'm just wondering if, uh, My understanding of it is more of like a putting together like a conservation plan for that part of the lake, like maybe similar to what happened over um, on the other side, on the northern border of the inland port boundary. Um, do you think, like what would that undertaking look like? Would it require us to redo the work that's already been done? Um, would it require land swaps, as Councilmember Dugan said, all of the above? just depends on what the outcome of whatever that process is. That process in the uh, area west of the airport mm -hmm. was actually led by the property owners. So they came to the city with a proposal. The city didn't right, facilitate but, that. or So it's a little bit different. That's my recollection um, as well. So I think it, again, it, it just really depends. I think the other reality is that we have a significant piece of land that's already been entitled under current zoning that didn't require any sort of other change and so it's hard for us to come in at this point in fact it's probably illegal for us to come in and change that entitlement um, that they're developing under and so that's that makes that part challenging and that gets to some of the 2900 west the 3200 west what happens between those streets um, so again it's it's just really hard to say what that might uh, some sort of a conservation plan that entails more than just this area means yeah no I, I appreciate that I, I think that answers the question um, I also want to uh, had a question about just um, air quality um, that I know that previously we've discussed a lot of safety concerns about residences in this area because of the noise from the airport is there any um, concern about um, um, the air quality not or being too poor for people to safely work in this area um, as w in addition to the noise pollution concerns? Like, is that a concern at all? Well, air pollution from the airport is definitely a concern and one of the reasons why we don't allow residential uses at, on both ends of the runway and so, for well, some distance. So yeah. that, that is a reality. Um, I don't think that it's ever been to my knowledge, been studied what that impact is in Salt Lake City okay. to, and our airport. But other airports 
have been studied where there's pro where there's close proximity of residential um, and I believe for employees too uh -huh. and it, it has shown higher exposures to those okay so well let me just like put it to you the same way that it was put to me is why is it safe to have people working there if it's not safe to have people living there from a air quality perspective I can explain why it's different for noise but I don't have the answer right now about why it about air quality so if you can speak to that that would help me answer that question I think it comes more from a um, people have a basically a right for some reasonable ex economic return on their property and that's something that's enshrined in our constitution that we have to follow right and so if we're going to limit that or substantially reduce that and take that away the city's going to be on the hook for that cost and so part of it is recognizing what is the least impactful to the least number of people and i think one of the one of the big differences is that and now it's probably different for large lot residential like an acre plus but the job density per acre for these types of uses is really small and so it is minimizing the impact um, that doesn't mean it doesn't go away and those workers are forced with faced with that um, but there's also internal systems air purifiers and things like that that can help offset that impact um, when they're indoor activities if you're outdoor activities you're probably not there's probably not a great way to limit your exposure to those kinds of pollutants thank you Councilmember Pui? No, so I thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I've been learning a lot about this and talking a lot with uh, Councilmember Petro about this issue. And and um, while I still don't understand the decades of you know the history behind this, which seems to be a lot of history behind this uh, part of the part of town, um, and maybe some promises um, that you know, happened in the past that, you know, that some, there are some questions about what those promises were. Um, what I understand so far is obviously there is um, a, a lot of private owners uh, of land that they want to develop and a lot of, uh, you know, houses, uh, individual owners that are selling to those more commercial, uh, commercial looking uh, forces. Um, so the question for me is, can we stop that uh, without looking at the bigger picture? Uh, and the bigger picture for me, as, as I understand it, is also balancing the state, um, the state's influence on zoning and what that could affect, what the negative impacts of, of that could, could, could be for us. And, it wouldn't be the first time that um, it wouldn't be the first time that interests have gotten on the. You know, we're t talking about these things, you know, every week with legislation that is happening right now, um, with private interests go uh, to the state to ask them to allow things that we wouldn't allow, um, and en ends up being worse than what we would have allowed if we had. You know, if we met somewhere in the middle. I know that that is not a happy solution for those that want to preserve this land um, as it is right now. Um, but I am trying to balance all of these things, and they are very real. The state um, and those interests are very powerful. Um, and that, to me, is part of the equation, is I don't want to lose hold of this land um, and not having any zoning authority over this land that will allow some sort of some level of control um, and learning about size, uh, you know, size of the warehouse is important. And I know that saying the word warehouse and, and this land is might be um, hard for some some neighbors, um, but that is something that we can negotiate and say, well, we allow you this size of a warehouse, which means not getting a not getting a fulfillment facility, uh, which is ideal. We don't want fulfillment facilities, and in my part of town, and I'm sure, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for Councilmember Petro, but we don't want them in your area as well. Um, but we will prefer over the two manufacturing, good-paying jobs, you know, upper mobility and whatnot. I, 
Um, so th that is what I'm balancing, and I guess this is not a question, it's more about me <coughs> trying to put this, you know, balancing these things in my head and, and trying to look up for the for water and the lake and the you know the natural wildlife that is you know is currently there and i i really understand that there is a very hard decision to be made by this council um but understanding that the the powers are bigger than sometimes our, ourselves um and there are i mean you know council member here has been dealing with the inland port for you know since day one uh, are traumatized by it i don't want to assume that, but I'm sure that that was traumatizing. I'm really traumatizing myself these days with the legislature, but I, um, I, I would like to just put that together uh, because I think it is important part of the equation that sometimes we're not just saying out loud. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Pui. Councilmember Dugan, did you have another comment? Yeah, please. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate all the comments from the, the other council members and uh, just going back to the 2200 West Road and the and the and the dust and the dirt and everything else that's going on there now, I mean it's by right because they have the the property rights and they have the own the zoning for it. Has there been discussion on them, uh, maybe putting a pause on their development so we can look at their land trust, maybe a moratorium on some up zoning or some building out there? Is that a feasibility? Is there is there any room for discussion with them uh, at that point so we can look at this? Because I'm also going to, and you don't have to answer that right yet. Well, go ahead and answer that, and I'll go over to my next point, and then I have another question. So, uh, so it, proposals that have already been permitted, you can't put a moratorium on. Okay. All right. Yeah, so we, we can do things to try to work with them to minimize their impact during construction activities, um, and we've been working on that and so i think one thing that's helpful i think maybe for everybody is that when a project goes into the permitting phase it is not under the oversight of the planning division it becomes the building services division um, and they have a system in place to address those impacts if there's the fugitive dust which is a big one right now out there um, that's something that we have to work with the Department of Environmental Quality on, right? Because they're the ones who enforce that. And so we, um, we've we reached out to them. We've reached out to transportation to see if there's other options as far as um, vehicles on 20 turn west, particularly their speed. If there's a temporary speed limit reduction we can put on to help reduce the impact from those, from those trucks, recognizing that it is a very narrow road and sometimes those trucks when they're moving to the side to pass each other they're technically pulling onto private property in some situations mm -hmm. and so those are things that we are trying to work through um, it's probably going to entail us bringing in the contractors and developer and property owner and um, working out a solution there but we're we're working on doing that we're trying to facilitate that even though we don't really have any oversight as planning over the actual construction activities but uh, we want to be able to minimize those those impacts the best we can yeah i appreciate that because i would definitely appreciate that full court press on that issue because again everything's blown east and so they're on the west side of the road they don't feel any of the dust but that one guy's house is completely dusted now so i appreciate that i do have one other comment back to comes by please comment about the the, the uh, concern of the the state and land rights i I do believe that those states has got to uh, have some opening in their vision about preservation of sensitive areas. And yes, we may be concerned about some uh, the states doing different things to squelch our uh, desires to conserve and save the, the ecological balance between the Great Salt Lake and these, these wetlands. But I got to believe that they also have some uh, funding that we could possibly use for the preservation of the land. And I don't know what it looks like, but you know they 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 seem to want to save the Great Salt Lake in some of their language, uh, and I just say the word language, not uh, so. I'll just stop right there. Uh, uh, so let's see if, if they have some ideas that maybe some funding that we could use to leverage uh, the conservation uh, desires we have on the, in the area. So uh, and this last question. It, can you explain to me in a short line the shoreline heritage area preservation plan? What is that? Do, does that is that something that deals with this area, the, the shoreline preservation plan? 
So from my understanding, it's not a document yet. It's just an idea in the air um, of a future plan. So um, that would look at the broader area. So a part of the North Point area, but not just the North Point area. But I can't speak to exactly what it is. Is that something we're leading or is that the community? Is Nick's that's, shaking his head. That's the other Nick, sorry, Nick. No, I think, I think, Nick, you talked about it when that question was raised earlier, that it was, it's from an outside group. There's not a whole lot of details that we know about it. We've heard there's questions being raised, but at this point, there's nothing official in the works and nothing from the city. It's, and it would be, it's separate from and not included in the North Point Small Area Plan as drafted. Appreciate that. Uh, Councilman Petro. I would like to see developer agreements for anything that's built in this area that have a community benefit agreement as a component of it that would include potentially an escrow fund. Uh, Chris Southers' house has actual cracks in walls because of the force of these speeding trucks, and he shouldn't have to fix that by himself. That's not okay. Um, these are historic families on historic plots of land, and while they are gra grappling with the hard truth that change is coming around them, they should not incur unreasonable cost and inconvenience. So anyone who develops out here, I need to see a community benefit agreement as part of what we're doing with them. Um, and we need to protect these homeowners as much as possible. So I'm, I'm just trying to think how to put that into land use terms, right? So I'm, I'm, I, I'm trying to just kind of summarize what we're, what the, where the discussion is going. It sounds like there are certain land use rights that are already vested within the properties, right? We've already, a lot of that is already business park zoning. And we can talk about whether business park zoning is appropriate and if that zoning needs to change or things like that. But that's already existing. Um, for us to get money or funds or community benefits that I assume would be considered an exaction. And so we'd need to, that would need to be tied to not that I'm just trying to figure out what that means, like what all, what all these ideas mean. How do we balance these things? It seems like some sort of impact fee that would go to neighbors, but th that's not legal, right? Like impact fees don't go to yeah, private we'd have, people. It, it wouldn't. For something that's already entitled, you know, we couldn't apply something retroactively, and we, we could look into what that might mean this for future like zoning changes. This feels like a Tammy question. But yeah. She could figure it out. A Tammy question. <laughs> so um, I guess my, my question is where do we, a lot of things, the discussion has been interest, has been good, but I'm, I'm not sure, like, if I were sitting on that table, I wouldn't know where to go from here. Um, but maybe you do, and yeah, I'm Nick, just not Nick smart and Chrissy, enough. Are there clarifications? What, do yeah. you understand what we're I, hoping to see, or can we offer clarifications on things? I think for now it would be good if there's any sort of changes or anything like that you want to see to the plan, and then some direction. And I don't know that this needs to come now or until after a public hearing on this, but um, helping us understand your priorities for as far as implementation of the plan. I would like Business Park taken out completely. I think this the million square foot warehouse is evidence why we need to eliminate that. Um, and then I would like those buffers increased, like we talked about. Um, and I would like 32S to stay unimproved with assertive language. So a uh, question, just maybe zooming out, this is a master plan. So this is not a zoning ordinance, right? So this is setting the stage for how <coughs> both public funds and future ordinances. They overlap would. so tightly though because of the industrialization. Right, that's but coming. I think when we're talking about things like this must happen or this shall happen, I, I'm not, does, does that have a place in a master plan? Well, it, it could, it depends how does that on- work? You know, the, like, under, under state code, a general plan and any component of the general plan is a guiding document. The effect, I think this might be the exact words, the effect of which are established by ordinance. So depending on how we want to utilize this specific small area plan is really up to the council. And so if there are things that we want to be more <clears throat> um, strict in terms of language, then we can certainly add those 
um, we could also, until we can update a code, we can add something that, um, I mean, obviously we're not proactively going to be rezoning in this area. That's going to be up to those property owners to do that. Me, um, but that that would be something that the council could um, establish it as part of the, the plan. But maybe I ask, um, I'll ask a more specific question. With 3200 West, the plan says that it should stay un unimproved. If the language is not yet adequate to solve Councilman Petro's concerns, is there stronger language that we could put in there and how would that look different than what is already so, in there? So I'll jump in if that's okay. So one thing on the transportation or on the major streets plan, you know, we originally had a category that was unimproved, you know, unpaved. Um, the transportation division had us change that to local street because they don't have a category for that. Their categories on the major streets plan are, you know, arterial collector, local street. Um, but I think with your direction, we can make that stronger and, you know, add that category. <laughs> Yeah, and one of the things to think about too is that before, even though it's technically already an established ro public road, um, we we can, there, there's a provision in state code that says public roads, facilities, buildings, et cetera, essentially have to conform to the um, general plan. So before we allocate funds in the future, if some future city council decided or administration decided maybe we need to pave this to address some okay. reason. I don't know what that may be. Um, there would at least be a planning process that somebody would have to go to go through to amend the plan in order to do that. Okay. Because it's a public road, adding any gating or regulated access on there isn't possible, correct? It was a request from an interested party, so I'm just doing my Yeah, diligence. so it, it probably depends on if the property has access to other public roads. If they do, then we can limit the number of accesses and where, but if they don't, then we have to provide access. I'd be interested in knowing if we can limit traffic in any way on 3200 West. Councilmember Mono. Member Dugan. So I think Councilman Pito was kind of hitting and then the discussion here is a little bit more uh, stronger language, as I mentioned earlier. And I'll just give you the one example from page 35 of the thing, uh, of the implementation. You know, the 75-foot buffer on some wetlands. So flexibility of a wetland buffer through incentive-based tools, basically saying, hey, we, we have the incentive that we could, but the width could be reduced f with another incentive. And I really don't like uh, the idea of the buffers ever being reduced. And I, I almost think of that as, you know, you put a barbed wire fence up, it says you can't build here. Uh, and on the map, I know it shows where the wetlands are and the buffer areas are, but it'd be nice to be clear on, on like the Rudy Canal and on the other Jordan River and the other areas that are wetlands that would be pretty much be prohibited from building on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I'm, I'm assuming that's the verbiage, but I don't like to uh, assume that it's prohibited, but it might be suggested. So I can update the vision map to show the buffers from the canals in the Jordan River. The wetlands are a little bit harder because we would need, um, you know, a consultant to go out and do those studies. So that is a little bit more flexible. And that's why there's a footnote in there that talks about needing, um, you know, those to be actually designated. But so the vision map is flex a little gray on the wetland areas, but I can definitely do that that hard line on the canals, drains, and Jordan River. And, and then just to warn you on the, uh, should be, the, this is new development, should be prohibited from facing 3200. What is facing, is that 10 feet off the, off the uh, 3200, or is that 100 feet off 3200 feet? What is, if, what is facing, again, just from the layman, mean on, on 3200 West? It says no development facing 3200. To me, I don't, I don't, I don't understand the definition of that. So I, I'd like to be clear on, hey, we, you can't have access from 3200 into your property and you can't be within 50 feet of 3200, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Mr. Ch Mr. Chair? Uh, let's go to Nick Tarvit yeah. real quick and then Councilmember Puy. Just a quick question for Nick, if I may. You mentioned that there's probably not gonna be any um, petition from the city to change <coughs> the zoning. <coughs> But will there be a, should the city consider a text amendment to do that North like, Point? Style? Likely, that would be highly likely. I meant a map amendment. Okay, wait, can you can you say that again so that we can? Understand? I'll let Nick explain since. So 
what I was referring to when I said there wouldn't be city initiated zoning changes, I was referring to map amendments, but we most certainly want to be proactive about the any sort of zoning rules that need to be put in place to implement the plan. Does that mean the zoning may stay business park, but we'll look at what business park allows? So the zoning that is already business park is mostly already entitled, right? So regardless of what we do to change that zoning, they're, they're, they're entitled to a certain development under that, what their subdivision was approved for. So that's what, that part, our, our hands are fairly, I mean, they're lim our options are really limited for future zoning rules there. That doesn't mean that we can't negotiate with a property owner to try to do some things, whether there's some land swaps or something else, but it does mean that we can't necessarily apply some, or apply zoning rules that significantly impact what they were entitled to under their subdivision approval. So we, we're, we're gonna be somewhat limited. I guess from like a 10,000 foot level, I'm hearing we don't, like distribution centers, is not desired, but manufacturing may be a little bit more palatable because that creates jobs. Now, let's just say we all agree with that. Is there, um, would that not be like a similar enough level of development rights, just changing exactly what it is that that would be possible for us to consider well, or the, the any change? The problem is that, that, is that you're restricted? pulling out a, a use that they were entitled under and that can be problematic. Um, subdivision laws work a little differently than, than zoning is that, um, you know, and, and we recognize this, we did enter into an administrative development agreement with that property owner to ensure things like 2900 West gets built and things like that, um, right? Because that's what we felt we had to do in order to implement that subdivision. And so we had, we did, part of that, we did have to recognize that they had a certain entitlement right. Um, so we'd have to look at that. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't change things that would require other aspects of the zoning to change. Um, but just like what we would do with a single family zone where there was a minimum lot size of 12,000 square feet and then we came out and, and some city down the road said, no, we want the minimum lot size to be 18,000 square feet. Those entitled lots are entitled to develop, right? And so that, that's kind of that's what I mean when I'm talking about entitled. But the land is not so, entitled to be subdivided, it, whereas it could have been subdivided to 12,000 square foot lots. If it's not yet subdivided, right, it we, would then have to go to 18,000 square right. feet. Right. So we couldn't restrict that development that was... If the lot exists and the lot is not changing its boundaries, it can still do what right, was we, allowed. That's right. Okay. That's similar to... A, property in a zone that requires 50 foot minimum That's street correct. frontage that does not have that can still be built up on. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Councilman Pui. That was actually very useful for me, that last, those last three <laughs> minutes. Uh, not, not that the ones before weren't. Uh, <laughs> they were. Um, so the, how, do we, how do we have official designation on wetlands? What the process for that is? Yeah, it's a process. So we would need a con the either the property owner would need a consultant, or if we decided the council directed us to do a more comprehensive wetland plan, we would the city would need to hire a consultant. But they follow the Army Corps of Engineers protocol, and they have um, you know I can find it in the plan. But there's essentially three characteristics of wetlands. You know, they have to do with water, and um, I can't remember off the top of my head. But there are you know specific characteristics that would qualify it to be a designated wetland. Um, then that report would be submitted to Salt Lake, Public Salt Lake City's Department of Public Utilities to review. So, you know, just because something looks like a wetland, we would actually need that study to be done to determine if it is. That's why that vision map is a little bit flexible. We, um, we took the state's data, which hopefully is correct, but it might be wrong. That's why we need that, those designations to be done. Do you think there will be any difference if a private developer is paying for this study versus the city is paying for it, they have to follow the same rules. Mm -hmm. And we, we believe that that's true, 100%. Okay. Yeah. I, okay, uh, so I, oh, go ahead. You know, so if, if that's the case, I will definitely like to, I mean, I will, I will feel more comfortable with this, this setbacks if we, the, this is required, and I don't know, if, you know, I don't know if the, the council would prefer to do this or we put it on the developers, but I, this, this study is the, um, for sure needs to happen. Just I don't want us to make a mistake on this, on this boundary. 
I think I have an even more basic question related to wetlands. We have land, some is, that is zoned for development already. Are we saying that we could go and do a study and say, well, this land, even though it's, de de it's zoned as business park right now, it meets the qualifications and the standards to be considered a wetland, so we can then call it a wetland and you can no longer develop up upon it? It's more than likely that you that it wouldn't be something that you could not develop. It's something you'd have to do whatever mitigation the Army Corps of Engineers would require in order to develop, which is how that works. We as a municipality couldn't say, because this is a wetland, you may never develop on it. We would say you would have to we'll, mitigate we whatever double, environmental. We can double check with public okay. utilities, but yeah, my, that's my understanding. Well, that, that's important for us. Yeah, that's, that's an important question, because this is important, but I also would say, from the developer standpoint, you know, you you build on a wetlands, your cost goes through the roof, right? Because you're basically building on we've someone some big development somewhere recently in the west uh, built on an area that was really hard, and they added add a lot of extra concrete, and the cost went three times. So this is important that we understand where the wetlands are, not only for our standpoint, but for the devel uh, developer standpoint. And I, yes, everyone's going to use the same data, but it's also do you trust if the city does the consulting or the developer does the consulting? Well, I think that was my question. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah my exactly. question is, I'm with, I'm with you. We may be going down a rabbit hole, yeah. but I think it's important. Um, the it sounds like from planning staff that there are two options: either the developer can initiate that, or the city. But what would compel the developer to initiate a wetland study, which would then potentially restrict their ability or make more difficult their ability to develop? Why why would they do that? And why wouldn't we just proactively have to do that if we're trying to protect natural environments? So as it is now, if, you, if there's a suspected wetland on your property, you would be required to either way. And then if this plan goes through, you know, that would be a requirement of the developer um, if, they, if, it's de if it's shown on the map or if there's a suspicion that there's a wetland on their property, it would be required. Um, I did want to specify that the plan includes designated wetlands, which are those um, wetlands under the Army Corps jurisdiction. Like, I'm not an expert in this, but like waters of the United States floodways. And then there, the plan also includes non-designated wetlands, which are also, um, they would include those characters as well. They're just not under that federal designation. But it's important to note that there are high quality wetlands that might not fall under that federal des designation. So the, the plan includes both. Okay, so the plan that we are looking at that we'll receive public comment and we may actually adopt in the next few weeks is currently already requiring that developers, if there's a suspected wetland, do this study. And if the study determines that it is in fact a wetland, they must remedy that situation or choose not to develop on it. It might. Well, um, Making that too so, it, so right now in code, there's there's no requirement for buffers from wetlands. It would they would just purely need to follow the federal designation. So whatever the Army Corps of Engineers requires for mitigation, um, and I'm not sure what those things are, but this plan would set up those buffers and the you know undevelopable area. Does so a master plan with buffers indicated become binding, or do we have to then pass a zoning ordinance that also implements those? So that that gets back to that statement I made about the effect of which is determined by ordinance. So your, your adopting ordinance can add more teeth to the plan than what most plans do. Okay, so, so I'm we, we can, guessing we based can on the conversation with, that council members would like to explore that, right? We can work okay. with the attorney's office on the best way to figure that out. But, um, and and if, if it's something where we feel like where we end up saying, you know what, we need a actually adopt something into the code, then we can also chart that path, what that looks like to do that as quickly and effectively okay, as possible. Okay, so the th North Point Smiley Plan, there's some things that we may be wanting to do that are making this have more teeth than any other standard master plan would have, and that includes 3200 West, wetland buffers, am I missing, what are the other ones that? Okay. We'll, we'll try to identify all those locations with the, particularly with those design standards or any development standard that's recommended in the plan. We'll, we'll look at those and try to figure out how to do that and then. Um, so council members, do we want to proceed with the proposed schedule or? I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Councilor Warren. Mine's actually about what we were talking about before. 
um, on the um, the rights um, and taking away a right that exists before. Is this why the Planning Commission recommended adding the use of distribution centers, or is that unrelated? I think that was unrelated. Okay, so so if we choose not to ad, uh, adopt that recommendation that the Planning Commission had, uh, that doesn't present any legal issues with, okay, thank you. Okay, so, so that's just an amendment to the plan. So Mr. Chair, going back to your question that uh, I think it'd be nice to have some more answers before we do another public hearing is one thought because we haven't had any public no i think we're going to have that one did we have one you're no 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 we're not we haven't had one we haven't had any public hearings you the council agreed last week in announcements to set the public hearing That's right. for march 7th right so, so but we have a lot of unanswered questions that maybe we want to have those answered before we go to that we noticed it are so, you I, we have two weeks, so I feel like we can potentially get information before then. And I don't think there's any harm in allowing people to comment, even if we're not prepared to vote. The discussion is, so what we need to decide is, we have the public hearing on March 7th. If there are still enough questions, then we should hold open the public hearing to allow continued public comment for the changes. Right. Okay. You're right. I'm good with that. Okay, so we'll proceed as, as planned, but it sounds like we have some work to do to figure out some of these questions. Councilors, do you feel like you have all your questions out on the table, not necessarily answered yet, but at least asked? I want to thank Nick and Chrissy. They have shown up for like the last 18 months with me in random places and in predictable places. They've heard anger, they've heard hope, they've heard all the full range of human emotion, and they've done so with grace and dignity and been just amazing ambassadors for the city. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll echo that. Thank you. That thanks. All right. That ends item number two. We're going to move on to item number seven. We're jumping ahead, which is the water and snowpack report. And it is Laura Briefer, the director of our public utilities department that is, I think I saw her. Oh, hi, Laura, uh, is here with us to deliver this report. Thank you everyone for coming and being engaged in that last item. Hi. All right, hi Laura. Hi. <laughs> I see Stephanie and... So I'd like to introduce a couple of members of uh, our staff that are very relevant to this conversation. Um, I think you, most of you know Stephanie Dewar. She's our water conservation manager. Um, so she's our point of contact and principal planner and implementer of the city's water conservation program. And then we also have Tamara Pru, who is our water resources manager. Uh, Tamara's role is multifaceted. She is in charge of administering the city's water rights under my direction, and that's a really big job right now with the water right adjudication that we have been working on since about 2017. Um, she's also involved in managing and directing all of the hydrology elements of our system, so she has staff that have all of the measurement devices on streams and intakes and treatment plant outflows and <laughs> everything else. So she's, uh, she's in charge of making sure that all of that information is transparent and put together uh, it, pursuant to our state statutory obligations as well concerning our water rights. Um, so they both help uh, the department a lot in many aspects of our water resources management. I'll also say since an element of this presentation is on runoff, I think online we have uh, Jesse Stewart, our deputy director, who um, has vast knowledge about the city's infrastructure, including our um, stormwater runoff infrastructure. And uh, Scott Swinger is um, the lead on the operations side um, on our stormwater system, so he and his crew are responsible for making sure that the stormwater system is maintained uh, so that it adequately captures and conveys runoff. Okay, did you, um, sorry, you said we have water conservation manager and water resources manager. Did I get those right? Okay, thank you, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, and just, you know, 
we have uh, staff here from different divisions of our department, and so you'll see just we all have to work together this time of year in a really integrated way because we are monitoring for our drinking water supplies and we are also monitoring for stormwater runoff and managing some of the same parts of the system to meet both ends. So we work very closely together. Um, okay, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is just a reminder of Salt Lake City's water service area. Um, so this, we serve water to more than 360,000 people. Um, that includes all of Salt Lake City and large portion, portions of Mill Creek, Holiday, and Cottonwood Heights. Um, the Salt Lake City portion is in the light blue, and then the areas we serve outside of our city is in that kind of purple color to the south. Um, we also serve small portions of South Salt Lake, Murray, and Midvale. And this was really a result of Salt Lake City extending our water service lines, you know, 100 years ago or so to help um, uh, to help make sure that the Salt Lake Valley is uh, growing and developing. At the time, anywhere we extended those water service lines, um, there was an agreement that we would annex those areas into the city, but over time that didn't happen and it was unincorporated Salt Lake County. And now we have cities that actually incorporated or annexed on top of the water system that we serve to them. So um, we have great relationships with the communities we serve outside of our city too. So we work very closely with um, particularly Mill Creek Holiday and Cottonwood Heights and Salt Lake County. Um, we also serve, uh, are charged with stormwater management and sanitary sewer management. And that is very specific just within Salt Lake City's boundaries in the light blue. Um, we do have a service area map online, um, and that posting of that map actually meets current constitutional requirements uh, that were created in 2020 when voters passed Constitutional Amendment D, where we had to show um, exactly where a municipality serves water, both inside and outside of its service area. A state constitution? Yes, uh, Utah Constitution. Um, next slide, please. So with respect to water supply, there are a number of components that we review when we are trying to uh, forecast what our water supply outlook is going to be. And we're still relatively early um, right now in terms of accumulations of snowpack, although things are, the picture is becoming quite clear to us <laughs> um, because of the, t the type of snowpack we have right now. Um, so we look at snowpack, we currently have uh, above average snowpack and we're not anticipating that to change. Uh, we are in a persistent drought still. It has improved since last year, but it's still persistent. And the figures on this slide show um, on the top what the drought picture for the state of Utah looked like this time last year. And you'll see the, the darker the color on this map, the higher stage of drought uh, we're at, the more significant the drought. And you'll see um, as of February 14th, this year, a lot of those colors on the map lightening up, which means our drought still exists, but the severity isn't as extreme as it was last year. Um, we also look at soil moisture levels, and based on the most recent uh, federal soil moisture maps, it appears that our soil moisture is improved. The reason why that's important is it impacts the efficiency of runoff, so mo more water runs off into our streams and reservoirs rather than getting soaked up into the soil. So with that information, uh, currently we're, we're looking at a high probability of average or um, above average watershed yields, especially from our surface water sources in uh, the Wasatch Mountains and then those surface water sources that affect Deer Creek Reservoir. Um, and for instance, um, with respect to the, the canyons, uh, City Creek, uh, Parley's Canyon, Big Cottonwood and Little Cottonwood Canyons, uh, we are at 123% to 193% of average, potential average forecasted yield for those local Mount, Wasatch Mountain watersheds. So that's really good news. 
Um, we do have another month prior to the beginning of the water year to still you know, observe what happens with our snowpack as well. Next slide, please. Can I ask a, can I ask a question yes. about Laura? Sorry, we have a little extra time and this is always interesting to me. So <laughs> um, 123 to 193% of our annual yield, that means <clears throat> that the reservoirs are projected to receive 123 to 193% more water than normal or? Um, it, it means that the amount of water that might be coming from those watersheds uh, would be that quantity, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will all come down at the time when we need it. Because it may come in the form of a flood, which would... Or it might come earlier in the year when our water demand is less, or, um, you know, or it might you know, be absorbed into the groundwater system, so. Um, and this is 123 to 193% of average, of average or of what like we need to sustain it's, our use? Uh, no, it's, it's of, of average and it's a 20-year 20, 20 average. 20-year yep. average, but yeah. they've just recently updated the 20-year right. period, so it's a drier period, I'm sorry. So it's, a, it's based on a, a federal, so it's uh, the National Weather Service maintains the 20-year average of these systems. Um, based on hydrology and every so often they update the span of time so um, when we, because we're such an old department <laughs> um, if, <clears throat> if you were looking <laughs> if you were looking at average if you were looking at <laughs> at the um, average <laughs> not us but the department itself well, yeah <laughs> some of us <laughs> but, no if we were looking at average um, so average conditions 10 years ago, um, average would have had a little bit different definition because it was okay. based on a, on a wetter period. So we're looking at an average that, that to us um, might reflect less than what we initially started, like our 40 or 50 year plans, but it's still a good number. So, so. I, I'm sorry, 100% if it were just baseline, 100%, does that meet our use and our projected use? If, if we were to always have a 100% year, would we still be in a drought? No. We would not, okay. It, it, it will take us multiple years to get out of a out drought, of the drought at 100%. That's why we're still forecasted to be in a drought this coming year. Understood, okay. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. And I heard, I, did you shake your head on that? Yeah, did it's, because it's been, the last 10 years have been drier than average, so the fact that it's higher, it's higher than a dry period, not higher than a wet period. Uh, Got it? Yeah. So the last 10 years have been the driest, some of the driest and hottest uh, weather patterns on record. So and so it's, a, it's an average okay. compared to that 10 year dry period, not say the 1980s that were really wet. Okay. So we That's have to helpful. sort of adjust our thinking on that a bit, which is we weird. It's hard for us <laughs> <Yeah>. to. <laughs> and does the intensity of the heat in the summer, does that affect how far our water supply goes like As, if we adjust yeah. for all of these heat waves we actually need to be above what 100 percent used to be regularly is that yeah and and that's actually um great questions it, they are good questions and we have um we're in year five actually of a, a climate vulnerability assessment for water and stormwater um, because of weather and climate intensification hotter temperatures uh, more intense drought or more intense weather, more energy in the system, period. And, um, and so heat does have, warming has an impact on the availability of water from, uh, from a number of, with, with a number of factors contributing to that. And it also has um, an impact on the demand of water too. So we have to look at both the supply and the demand side in that in that situation. And just on top of that comment, so if the, if we have a really warm spring, this is great, but it's not awesome. If we have a cool spring and a late summer, this is great. Because the water stays in the mountains longer yes. for <laughs> us to use. Okay, Councilman Pui. Um, I have probably something that will sound very dumb for you guys, but um, so runoff, um, a storm water. Um, so some of the water we wanted to, we wanted to put it through the system. Uh, by the system, 
this how I understand it is is rooms and big gigantic buildings that clean the water and puts it in pipes and send this to the city. I play Sim City a lot, and uh, that's how <laughs> I know about all of this. Um, I'm an expert for sure. But so, but there is some water that needs to go down uh, in the ground to you know keep the rivers and whatever they are and, and, uh, under their like functioning too. It, so that's correct. Yes. It's correct. And the way that our water system works, it's, it's really a demand-based diversion, especially with the, um, the, the local streams. So our water treatment plants, just they take the quantity of water from this, directly from the stream to meet the demand on the system. Um, we're also not the only water right holder on some of these stream systems, and you know, so we can't we can't divert the entirety of a stream, nor nor would we want to, um, in order to meet to meet our needs. So. So my question goes to perme per permeable surfaces. Um, there is many cities that are going in that direction, requiring permeable surfaces for parking lots, for example. Um, instead of just putting unpermeable, um, you know, concrete uh, or pavements, so to allow some of the water to go through it uh, underground instead of going to the storm system, it, uh, but that sort of in my mind and in my SimCity knowledge of water, uh, wouldn't that uh, conflict with the goal of sending a lot of water to the to the Jordan River and ended up in the in the Salt Lake? Uh, I don't. I used to play Sim City also, and I don't even remember <laughs> that part of it. Oh, we need um, to play together. So. I, will, I will show you. Oh, this is um, getting weird. So, <laughs> I don't know what it is. So there oh. you go. <laughs> um, I'll explain it to you. Later. Oh, so <laughs> we, um, yes. Yeah, so it's interesting in in water management. We are meeting a whole lot of different purposes all at once, and we're constantly trying to balance them. Um, with respect to runoff, we're also trying to manage for water quality and infiltration into the system. And one of the impacts of a lot of pavement, impermeable surfaces, is that it negatively impacts water quality. And so having a chance, like this low impact development, impermeable or permeable pavement is an example of that. There's some other examples too. But that's important for us to have in, in our area because the Jordan River is actually um, compromised for water quality in part because of the urban runoff. And so having areas where we, where we can slow the water down and that, that actually would also help with uh, flooding issues, especially in these long-term flooding events. And we're currently working on an integrated water plan to kind of tie these things together, as you mentioned. So I, I think you're, like, you're thinking kind of similar to to, to where we are at, where we want to manage to optimize water, drinking water resources. At the same time, we want to make sure we're mitigating flood impacts, especially from these intense storm events. Um, at the same time that we have water quality issues we need to deal with. So there are a lot of moving parts there. I, I, and I'm looking at the cities that are doing the permeable parking requirements, and I'm very interested in that, but I obviously need to refer to you guys for expertise. And it's important to replenish our groundwater aquifers. And um, we're still trying to figure out the link between uh, groundwater, shallow groundwater, and deep groundwater to tributaries of the Great Salt Lake and Great Salt Lake itself. Interesting. So, uh, we have been asking a lot of questions. I see there's no, five more slides. <laughs> <coughs> Water's always an interesting topic. It is. Yeah, it is, and I, this slide here um, is just one of the creeks, one of the streams that we, um, that provide us water, Big Cottonwood Creek, and I just wanted to show you, I, we look at a lot of data when we're doing our forecasting, and these graphs on the bottom are from the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, and they are, um, they, they show what the anticipated water supply from any given watershed will be, um, and then they um, compare it to different years, historic years. So we have sort of an index of, well, this looks like 2005, or this looks like 1983. Um, and this is Big Cottonwood Creek, and on the 
left, we have 2022. That was, this was last year. And in 2022, the final numbers for the annual yield was about 20,700 acre feet from Big Cottonwood Creek. That was 60%, 61% of the average. And for 2023, the forecast um, at the end of the day is for about 49,000 acre feet of water from Big Cottonwood Creek, or 144% of average. So from this, you can see you know, a, what a difference a year makes. Um, this is a really good thing for us to be seeing. Um, for Big Cottonwood Creek, I think the closest water year on there is 2011. So that, that light green line at the top of the graph shows what the yield was for Big Cottonwood Creek in 2011. And the, the, what's showing is that the forecasted yield is somewhere between average and that high period of 2011. And there's also the low, um, the low bar, the, the lowest green line on the graph is, I believe, 1934. And that was a really, really dry period that actually was a time that initiated a lot of additional water supply planning for Salt Lake City. Yeah, it was, it was yes. Uh, Utah, Utah Lake, I think, was um, very, very low uh, at that time. So, so we're excited about the storm tonight, is what I'm, I'm hearing. I'm pretty excited from a water supply standpoint. <laughs> 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 um, but you also see just sort of the quantity, the difference in quantity, and this is why, in our long-term water supply and demand planning, that we're really conservative about what we. Um, what we assume we're going to receive from any part of the hydrologic system because you can have such vari variabilities year over year. Uh, next slide, please. So another data point that we look at is called snow water equivalent, or SWE, is <laughs> what we call it. And, <laughs> Um, that really just determines how much water is in the snow. Snow can have different water content, and we're fortunate this year that we have high water content snow. Um, on the map here, as of January 31st, you can see that the snowpack throughout, of, throughout uh, Utah is um, well above the median in the snow water equivalent. That's good news for us. That's that dark blue color. Uh, next slide, please. So we also look closely at precipitation and temperature um, with outlooks, and we receive these three-month seasonal outlooks from um, various federal agencies. This is from the National Weather Service. And seasonal precipitation and temperature factors are really both are important in both the water supply and the demand on the system. Um, these factors also, as we kind of talked about earlier, affect the timing and volume of runoff, um, both for drinking water and for flood control purposes. And for this year, the three-month outlook through May um, projects equal chances for above or below normal precipitation and temperature. So right now, it's not really telling us a lot. Um, if it was clearly skewed in one direction or another, that would give us more information. Um, typically, lower temperatures and higher precipitation can reduce the environmental and system water demand in the early spring, but fast warming on the system can increase high runoff and flooding potential from runoff. So that's, that's why those um, factors are important. And did you have something to add on the temperature piece? Just the, the, the idea that temperature drives demand, it more correctly drives need because if we look at our historical water use patterns, especially in the last several years if we've been contending with long-term drought, our communities we serve have done an exceptional job reducing their water use. So high temperatures don't necessarily equal higher demand, but they equal higher pressure on our environmental systems that might drive demand. And we've seen this in high, like hot summers, we see demand go up on the system. Um, next slide, please. Uh-oh. <laughs> so um, here I wanted to talk about reservoirs. Uh, 
the photos that you see in this uh, slide are Mountain Dell or Little Dell Reservoir on the top and Deer Creek Reservoir on the bottom um, in their winter finery. And we use reservoirs to store water to help us through drought years to meet annual system demands. And they also help us through the really warm parts of the summer when runoff decreases and we still have some demand um, that we need to make up. Um, Deer Creek Reservoir in particular is really critical for Salt Lake City and provides annually somewhere between 30 to 35 percent of our water supply. Um, and it, it really helps us have a reliable supply during year-over-year -year droughts. We participate in the Deer Creek Reservoir along with um, one and a half million people from Utah County and Salt Lake County um, through our membership of the Metropolitan Water District of Salt Lake and Sandy. And I know you've had um, Mike DeVries uh, talk a lot about the history of, of Metro. Um, but that, uh, that, is, that water is actually through the Federal Provo River Project and the Central Utah Project. Um, one thing to note is Deer Creek Reservoir, we have a, there's a project that needs to happen on that reservoir uh, to repair an intake structure that's about $100 million. There is a request for appropriation um, through the state legislature this year for $11 million of that, and we're, we're working hard to see that go through um, just to offset some of those costs because the cost... A, portion, a large portion of the cost of that project gets filtered back through Metro and then to us. Um, Little Dell and Mountain Dell Reservoirs in Parley Canyon are also important for water supplies, and Little Dell Reservoir especially is important for flood control for us as well. So that was constructed since the 1983 floods and helps take a lot of pressure off the system by capturing water in the Parley's watershed um, up high while other water goes downstream. Next slide, please. Um, water conservation. I'm, I'm sorry. Is, oh, Just go back to the Little Dell. Is, uh, is that construction completed? Mountain Dell, uh, Mountain Dell Reservoir is still under construction, okay. the, the rehabilitation. Um, however, if we have to start impounding water in there, we'll, we will be able to do that. So. Um, water conservation is, is a really important um, component of our water resource management and supply and demand. Last year, our communities um, that we serve conserved almost 3 billion gallons of water compared to the three-year rolling average. Um, it's really necessary for the long term um, in order to stretch our long-term water supplies and also uh, during short-term uh, water shortage situations such as uh, droughts, which we hope are short term. <laughs> um, so we, as we mentioned before, we're going to need multiple years of the winters like this in order for us to exe exit the drought status um, in our region. Um, and then because of that, we'll still be asking the communities we serve to conserve water this year. We ask them to conserve water every year, but very specific to the drought and to the stages within our water shortage, water shortage contingency plan. Can I ask a specific question about that? If I remember correctly, we were in stage two, and then it, we moved into stage... We are in stage two. We haven't... Um, because, because we were so successful at conservation and meeting demands, we've stayed in stage two. We haven't had to move to more progressive mandatory stages. Um, this year, we're going to monitor to see if it warrants us moving back into stage one, um, or if it's something that where we want to stay in stage two. I guess that's a question that I have about um, how that decision is made to go from stage to stage, because we have a great water year this year, and that's good, but that doesn't mean we're out of the drought, so we still okay. need, um, we still have less water than we need, if I, yeah. I'm putting it in the most simple terms. <laughs> so, uh, like, I guess I, what I've heard from some people is like, why don't we just ramp up to the highest stage and stay there until we're out of the drought? Like, can you help me <laughs> explain to constituents why, why we would ever move back a stage while we're still in a drought? 
Yeah, I mean, it, really, if we if we were in one of the higher stages where we had mandatory restrictions, um, then we might consider if 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 conditions improved enough, we would consider moving back a stage. Um, and just because mandatory restrictions, um, you know, they cause some hardship sometimes and, um, and cost and cost for sure. Um, so I mean. There is that, but, but from the water supply and demand planning, we're really careful about moving from stage to stage. Um, as you mentioned, you know, if we're still in a drought, even though we're having a good year right now, we are still in a drought, and we don't know what next year is going to look like. This could just be you know, an anomaly within the 20-year mega drought. And so we want to make sure that we are still doing everything we can to conserve so that um, we have the storage capacity available if we have additional year-over-year -year droughts. And we also have Great Salt Lake to worry about right now, too. And Great Salt Lake is, is something that um, we are planning on including in our long-term water supply and demand plans as well. Okay, thanks. Did I answer your question? I think so. Next slide, please. I think this is my last slide. Um, and while uh, we have a lot of snowpack, I know you're very sad to know that we will not be kayaking down State Street <laughs> like this East High School student did in 1983 in this picture. Um, <laughs> we've had a lot of improvements since to, this, to the uh, storm drain system and to um, the impoundment system that really helps us manage large runoff events. Um, from snowpack. But we have been fielding a lot of calls and concerns about potential flooding this year because of spring runoff, and I know others in the state are also concerned about it too because statewide we do have substantial snowpack. Um, since 1983, um, a lot of infrastructure improvements have been put into place. Um, I mentioned Little Dell Reservoir, but we also had the Folsom um, Pipeline that increased capacity on City Creek and some additional uh, pipeline and stormwater conveyance systems down near Liberty Park and near the Jordan River. So a lot of work has, has gone into um, addressing our stormwater system that way. Uh, we also coordinate very closely with Salt Lake County Flood Control. They are responsible for the, the streams themselves, and so we work really closely with them to make sure that grates under culverts and um, it, or debris in the streams um, are, are managed, particularly bef before storm events or before big runoff events. And then system cleaning and maintenance, that's why I invited Scott Swinger um, of our operations team here, because his team really has a systematic approach to um, assessing the stormwater system uh, making sure it's maintained, making sure it's cleaned, and, um, and ready for runoff events. Um, Scott's team has also uh, filled about 6,800 uh, bags of sand um, that we have available for anyone in the public who wants to pick them up. Um, I think we're limiting them to 10 bags right now, and it's just more of a precaution, especially if, um, you have a, if there's a history of flooding on a property, for instance. Um, that we have those bags available. So Where does the public get a hold of those bags if they need them? Um, so yeah, so they could just call our line or visit our website to get a hold of those bags, but we have them outside on our um, West Temple campus. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Member Wartron, can we get a graphic that shows um, what the um, percentage of water users are like? residential, commercial, agriculture. Yep. Yeah, we, we have that information. We can get that to you easily. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions on this, council members? So in a really high summary, good year, but we're still in a drought, so keep saving water. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Um, we are going to jump back to item number four which is Local Business Assistance ARPA Grant Awards. I understand that, um, well, so we have at the table, Ben Ludke, Council Policy Analyst, 
Uh, Lorena Riefel Jensen. Is Lorena here? Um, Director of Economic Development, potentially here. Kathy Rigby and Jane, Jake Maxwell, Economic Development Project Manager and Workforce Development Manager. Um, I understand, maybe this is a question for Katie, I understand there's some council members that will need to recuse themselves from parts of the discussion. What's the best way to handle that? Are, I hadn't heard that they were planning on recusing. Is it because they have some connection to some of the applicants? Or? I believe that's true, and okay. I think it's more than one council member. Do we need them to be removed from the entire discussion, or just once we start talking about those specific applications? Um, uh, oh, can, sorry, we're putting you on the spot. Uh, it's okay. I just don't know anything about it. So, oh, um, I talked to Ben earlier, and I am the one that may have some conflict of interest with some of the awardees. Um, the, out of the 31 that have been awarded or have been recommended to be awarded, um, I might have to recuse myself for about four of them um, if I have my count right. But only if we discuss those specifically. Like, if we discuss those four businesses specifically, then I will recuse myself. But I think out of the policy about how we distribute ARPA funding, I think I'm eligible to have that conversation but not necessarily, but not discussed directly about, not discuss those four businesses specifically. Does that make sense? So we're talking about a grant and how we distribute the funds and how they decided and the, the scoring, all the stuff, and I can discuss that. But if I don't think I can discuss, well, John, you know, which I have a relationship with, I want to talk about John's application, like, no. Oh. Does that, Does that make sense? Uh, th thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Uh, to the extent you are talking broadly about the terms of the grants, that's fine. If you do get into details about specific applicants, I do think you'll need to recuse yourself because if you're taking from one applicant to give to another, then that entire conversation probably requires recusal. So e even if we're talking about an applicant for whom Council Member Valdemaros does not have a, a conflict or uh, with whom? Yeah, I, I'm, I, and again, this is the first I'm hearing it, okay. so I'm, I'm doing the best I can. But I, I think that w my concern would be if the council member is recused just for one applicant, but that affects yeah. how much another applicant would get, then it's sort of the entire conversation. Okay. But I'm, I'm willing to, to be creative about that as well. Okay, thanks. And so, council members, let's keep our questions and discussion very high level and then if we decide we need to get into specific applications we can let council member baltimore know. i believe council member Petra, who is gone for another commitment anyway right now but has also a uh, conflict that she mentioned so um let's make sure we're talking high level until we need to change that and then we'll let council members know first okay all right i uh, ben do you want to go ahead and start with an introduction yes and uh, a note, uh, whichever applications are moving forward with funding, uh, I'll double check with council members to make sure that on the motion sheet, we'll have separate votes uh, to make sure that you're recused on the final, the final vote. Uh, council members may remember last April, uh, you approved a $2 million appropriation for one-time money from ARPA for local business assistance grants. Uh, to be managed by the Economic Development Department. These are direct beneficiary grants, so the funding would go to support the operating costs of the business, so things like rent, payroll, supplies. The council also, the same night last April, enacted an ordinance to create a committee to review the applications and recommend funding to you and the mayor. Uh, the council has final decision-making authority on the amount of the awards and to which recipients. There were 157 applications received, and of those, 31 are recommended to receive grant awards. The total rewards are a little over $755,000. This is less than the full eligible amount that the 31 businesses applied for. If you wanted to award the full eligible amount, it would be an additional $125,000. Uh, 
Uh, there are two attachments. Uh, we have hard copies. Um, we have extras on the table uh, if you need them, but they were also placed at your desks. Attachment one is the funding log showing the 31 recommended recipients. And attachment three shows uh, a summary list of all 157 applications. Uh, the column in attachment three, that's second from the right, it's listed as average scores. It's out of 100. Higher scores are better. Economic development plans a second phase to accept more applications. So if one of the applicants in phase one is not recommended for funding, they could reapply for funding in phase two. A couple reminders, the maximum possible award is $100,000 that was set in ordinance. There is no minimum award, but the council could establish one. The council has established minimum awards for other grant programs, such as HUD grants. And the funds must be spent by the recipients by the end of calendar year 2024. That deadline is also set in city ordinance. Uh, there is a separate $2 million also from ARPA for pass-through nonprofit assistance. That process is being managed by the Community and Neighborhoods Department, and it will come to the Council later. I'll turn the time over to Lorena and her team. They have a presentation for you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I appreciate you having patience with me as we try to run upstairs with Jake. Um, we're looking forward to actually present this information to all of you. Um, I would also like to say that it, it has been a difficult and yet very rewarding experience for us to work, to have worked with um, Ken and their team, uh, Jack Markman and Tony Miller and Heather Roy. Um, I think this has been a really good experience for us to see how we can work together um, in terms of different departments. Also, we have worked very closely together with our, our finance department. Uh, Mary Beth and her team have been very supportive in guiding us to ensure that we're following federal guidelines um, and we're ensuring that we're doing things correctly. And the same thing with the attorney's office uh, thank you, Katie, and again, the support of um, Sarah Montoya and her guidance. Um, having said that, I think one of the things I wanted to share with you, we have um, Kathy Rigby sitting here at the table. She's our ARPA uh, grants uh, program manager, and we have uh, Jake Maxwell, who also, besides being a team uh, member of economic development, he actually is the chair of the community uh, um, recovery committee who has been serving, they have been serving diligently, um, they have been committed. These are individuals who actually serve on other boards in the city and now they're serving in this capacity. I've watched their meetings and their deliverance and I have to say I am wow by the level of thoroughness and commitment that they have with our, with our small business community as they have reviewed this grant. And with that, I'm gonna turn the time for Kathy to walk you through the program, and then Jake. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for this opportunity to tell you about our ARPA community grant program. Um, so the department, oh, next slide please. So the Department of Economic Development is coming before you today uh, with a two-part request. First, we are asking that you approve the Community Recovery Committee's recommended list of 31 applicants to receive funding. This is our phase one, group one list of applicants. Um, and secondly, we are asking that you approve distribution of the ARPA community grant funds in the amount of $755,718. Um, as Ben mentioned, you received transmittal materials which include a list of these 31 applicants. Uh, that also includes a brief description of the businesses um, and their funding request. Next slide, please. 
Uh, before we review how we arrived at our 31 applicants, we wanted to review the background, which Ben has also mentioned here today. Um, this council established by ordinance in April of 2022 the community grant program with the $4 million budget to be administered by both the Department of Economic Development and the Community and Neighborhoods Department, each of us with a $2 million budget. Um, the council also established the Community Recovery Committee, or CRC as we refer to them, uh, to aid the program in quickly, transparently, and fairly deploying the funds of this program. So we began our process with ARPA federal guidelines to determine which small businesses were negatively impacted by the pandemic. We identified the following four funding categories available to help small business. The first was, of course, small business, which in Salt Lake City is defined as a business with 50 full-time employees or less, and we included nonprofits as a business entity themselves. Um, they would be a direct beneficiary looking for revenue replacement only. Second was travel, tourism, and hospitality. Um, the businesses in this category were among the hardest hit by the pandemic. Uh, third are artists, artists and businesses. This group was named specifically in the ordinance and were the second hardest hit by the pandemic in Utah. Groups one through three make up the group one applicants that are the subjects of this transmittal request. I think we need to move forward one slide. Oh, sorry. Yep. Are we on the funding? Just say next slide. Oh, next then. slide, please. Apologies. Um, the fourth funding category that we have here is arts and small business recovery programs. These are submitted by nonprofit subrecipients and will pass through that funding. They make up group two of our phase one applicants. All four of these categories are how we will allocate our $2 million budget. And just for comparison on the right, we have identified the six funding categories that CAN, Community and Neighborhoods, plans to use to divide up their $2 million budget. Um, next slide, please. So once we eligibility was determined, the Department of Economic Development created a program that prioritized increased equity and decreased barriers to this economic opportunity. Um, we've highlighted a couple of ways in which we've tried to do that. So first, we allowed applicants two opportunities to apply. Our phase one application period happened from September 1st to the 30th. Um, they are the subjects of this transmittal request, our phase two application window will open sometime in March or April. We are allowing phase one applicants that are unsuccessful in receiving funding to apply along with new applicants in phase two. Um, we've also allowed artists and home-based businesses to apply. This was particularly important for independent businesses um, who could not fund a brick and mortar location and so are offering their products and services from their home. Um, the third way in which we've tried to expand our goals is to allow small businesses to be reviewed anonymously. There was some real and perceived um, name recognition bias that many members of the community mentioned, and so we wanted applicants to know that they, each applicant would be reviewed based on the merits of their application. And finally, we provided technical assistance. We had an expanded definition of technical assistance for all of our applicants. Um, and we provided some high and low tech ways in which they could receive the application itself, but also training um, and information as to how best to answer the questions of the application. Next slide, please. So the, our efforts led to 229 eligible applications being received. 32 of these applications were deemed incomplete um, for failing to provide additional documentation needed to review their application. Uh, I will note that we did reach out to these applicants to give them a second opportunity to provide the information, um, but in any case, they were closed as incomplete, but will be given an opportunity to apply again in phase two. Um, the subjects of this request, 157 small business applications were reviewed and scored by our committee. Um, and finally, we do have 40 applicants that are part of the arts and small business recovery programs being offered by nonprofit subrecipients that will be reviewed once CAN completes the review of their nonprofit subrecipients. Next slide, please. Under federal ARPA guidelines, um, applicants are, categorized in two, are categorized in two ways that we feel it's important for you to understand, impacted or disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. 
The final rule allows municipalities to expand this definition as suits the needs of their community. Um, so for example, we're listing the ways in which Salt Lake City has defined this. The federal government has defined businesses in the travel, tourism, and hospitality sector as impacted. Salt Lake City has expanded this to include businesses located in the downtown corridor between North Temple and 4 South and between 2nd East and I-15. The federal government lists businesses operating in qualified census tract locations as disproportionately impacted. Salt Lake City has expanded this definition to include businesses which are 100% female owned and businesses which are 100% BIPOC owned, meaning owned by a person from a black indigenous or person of color and also our arts and cultural business community. Um, an understanding of this language will help to inform you as you review the eligible uses of the funding that's allowed by the program. Next slide, please. So this leads us to some important demographics we wanted to share with you. 45 of our applicants were 100% female-owned businesses. 51 of our applicants are 100% owned by a member of the BIPOC community. So out of 229 eligible applicants, 42% are disproportionately impacted. Um, next slide, please. We also wanted you to see that there is an equitable distribution between the four funding categories that we mentioned earlier. So 61 of the applicants came from an artist business. 55 applicants were listed as small businesses. 77 applicants came from the travel, tourism, and hospitality sector. And as we mentioned before, we have yet to review 40 applicants from the nonprofit community, which will be our group two, which is the second half of our phase one application. I'll turn the time over to my colleague, Jake, for the next two slides. Thank you. It's good to be here to represent the Community Recovery Committee. Um, I'll introduce you to the board so you kind of understand the mix and the makeup. Um, we had two members of the Racial Equity and Policing Commission, Tanya Hawkins and Steve Anjordan have myself, Jake Maxwell from the Economic, Develop Economic Development Loan Fund Board. Um, we have two from the Human Rights Commission, Jason Wessel and Esther Next Stiller. slide, please. Oh, sorry. We're good. Thanks, Ben. Um, and we have one from our Salt Lake City Arts Council Board, Sarah Longoria, and Poot Carson from our Business Advisory Board. Next slide, please. So over the course of 10 review meetings, each two hours in length, uh, the board used the time to cover some key agenda items. The first is to review and discuss our submitted applications, um, our, our application scoring and the scoring experience. Uh, we also requested clarification about applications and process, and we discussed ways to improve fairness and equity. So over the course of 20 hours of work, uh, the committee moves forward this list of 31 businesses for your approval. Next slide, please. So again, the Department of Economic Development would like to ask this council to approve the Community Recovery Committee's recommended list of 31 applicants to receive the funding that were part of our Group 1, Phase 1, and to approve distribution of the ARPA Community Grant Funds in the amount of $755,718. Next slide, please. We're happy to take any questions if the council has any. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Okay, let's start with Councilmember Dugan and then Councilmember Valdemoros. Thanks, appreciate the uh, the uh, discussion here and the, the work that you've done on these applications. Uh, back on the anonymous side, is it like the name, district, and the address is anonymous? And I was just wondering the, the breakout from the city uh, across the districts. I, I guess, again, you have to apply. So first step is you have to apply. Uh, so uh, how that breakdown was, I'm, I'm glad that to see that the four groups were relatively, those are the applications and they're relatively evenly split, which is kind of nice to see just by application. But how about the district wide? Was I think that also an, anonymous? It is on the slide, isn't it? It's in the document right here. Uh, it? Um, or, I can, or maybe I'm confused. It's, it's an excellent question. I think it was provided, but we're happy to add. So go ahead, Kathy. Um, I'm happy to give you that. So out of the, all of the applications, we received five applicants from District 1. We received 44 applicants from District 2. We received 22 applicants from District 3. We received 66 applicants from District 4, um, 45 applicants from District 5, 18 applicants from District 6, and 19 applicants from District 7. Okay, 
Thanks. Just, just, just curious on, on the, yes. the anonymous side of the house. I appreciate that, that very much. Yeah, and on the anonymous yeah. side, I just want to mention that our software that we use, Salesforce, automatically generated a case number when applicants submitted an application. So the committee only saw the case number. We redacted any information that gave the business name or address, but everything else on the application they were able to see. They would, they would see like the description of what the business did or? This description, if they indicated their address in the description Whether or anything specific to their business owned. name, that was redacted. Great, and okay. I just have a question on the uh, oh, attachment three, the, the, the average scoring. When I looked through the, the top 31, like the 31, 31st had an average score of 76, but uh, number 32 had an average score of like 87. Yeah. And then, it, and so I was just wondering how they b broke up that, because I, I didn't, I couldn't Yeah, I that. think that's a, f that's a fair that's, question. That's and an I an think Kathy and yeah. Jake can answer that as well. That's an actually excellent question because what happened was um, the ordinance states that we wanted ge that the council wanted geographic equity. Um, the way that that was interpreted by our committee was to define that as at least one applicant from each district. When the scores shook out, there were two districts that didn't have an applicant that rose to the level of all the other applicants. So they um, discussed at length and carved out um, two spots. So there was at least one applicant from District 1, which fell into that same category, and one applicant from District 6. And they chose the highest scorer in those districts. Um, and that's why there was a carve out for those two applicants to move up um, in, in the final list. I, I still don't I I, yeah, fully understand that because there's more than just one. There's like, you have a bunch of 80s, yes. a bunch of <laughs> 70s, and, and the cutout here for the 31 was 76%. Yeah, yes, so I'll explain that. So a little further down in the list, you'll see three applicants that scored in the 80s. Um, they were set to receive funding, but ARPA regulations don't allow you to award someone funding unless they have proven loss. Um, and we did that in our program by submitting tax returns or profit and loss statements. And there were three businesses who scored really highly, um, high average scores, but who were unable to prove loss. And so that funding amount would have been zero based on ARPA regulations, and so we had to move them down um, because there was nothing we could award them. We did reach out to them. We did make um, several attempts to see if they could provide anything else that indicated that they had actually suffered a loss through COVID and they couldn't. Um, they are eligible to apply again in phase two if they have um, updated their tax returns or something that indicated they had some loss. But if they can't show loss, we can't award funding. So we had to move them down lower. And that was not told, that was not, um um, anywhere like before they applied in the application it didn't say hey only people eligible businesses if they sh if you know if you had a, had a loss if you didn't have a loss then don't apply because we're trying to help the ones that actually did have a loss. Yeah, it was very well mentioned in all of our training and in all of our materials and on our website. And we even discussed one-on-one -on -one with those particular applicants. Um, a lot of these businesses are used to using projections in their calculations, and so they wanted to identify that they had projected income at much higher amounts, um, and so had put that into their calculation of loss that they that they were impacted by through COVID, um, but we can't use that. We define loss as what we could see yeah, in your tax, tax return. return. Mm -hmm. That Mr. makes sense. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Councilman Pui. Oh, but oh, I'm not no, done no, yet. No, no. Oh. I'm not done yet. Okay, sorry. go ahead, Councilman Pui. Sorry. Yeah, so um, I, I had a proposal because I, I don't know if it's a proposal, but I would like to this, at least understand I mean, I'm not a super fun, like the, the funnest, uh, the greatest fan of the sliding scale because the differences between the ask and what they didn't get, it makes it complicated to me. So like there are, um, there are some applications that they requested $50,000, but now we're giving them 45, 8, 15, you know? And so that makes it confusing to me. Um, I would rather have if they ask for fifty thousand, and then if they, you know, if they're eligible, 
then just go for the 50,000. So that it's not the mas mathematical mess in my head. But then do, what's the arbitrary number like of like spending 755 only or the sliding scale took us to 755 and why didn't we just award the full $2 million to the, I don't know, 200 applicants that are eligible? I, I think this is a really good question that Jay can answer. The committee went through an incredible analysis and thorough discussion. I, I hear what you're saying and council member Valdemoros, um, I think in their thinking for what I heard watching their committee meetings was they were trying to include more businesses and by having a scale that allowed them to do that. But with that, I'm going to let Jake talk about it because I think he's the best person to answer that question. Yeah, I was hearing two questions, um, but the yeah, but the first uh, to your first question, uh, we deliberated for well into overtime uh, in our two-hour session, and one of our council members proposed um, paying for paying for performance on the application. So that's that correlating score, um, and then then becomes the percentage of, of grant funds that they receive. Um, can you explain, and that was in the effort to reach. Can you explain that a little bit, yeah, what I'm pay not. for performance yeah, so, means in this case? So if they received a score of 72 on their application, then they would receive 72% of the grant funds that they are eligible for. That's where those weird numbers that you're seeing yes, comes that, from. Right, correct. And the reason, the reason we did this was because our first priority was to reach more businesses. And so this kind of stretched the funds to reach more further down the list. Okay. Especially because we had a lot of small asks, um, some you know, within just a few thousand dollars. Right, yeah, I saw that. I, can I answer the second yeah, part the of second your question? Part, yeah. um, so two things went into that. Um, if we had only awarded the, the amount they were eligible for, we would have only awarded 27 applicants funding. Um, and so we were able to get that much, that many more applicants from 27 to 31 um, because of the sliding scale. And the priority for this committee, as I understood from the, the weeks of discussion that they had reviewing these applications, was to give as many businesses as much money as they could. So with that two-part thinking and goal mind, goal set in mind, um, they wanted to give more. Um, and then the direction that staff had from the committee as to why the arbitrary number is 755, um, we had this phase two approach, phase one and phase two approach because we wanted to um, be as equitable as we could and we understand that some small businesses are so busy engaging in keeping their business open that they might not have time to either apply or hear about this and we wanted to give as many businesses who needed this funding opportunities to apply and so we we got some money out fast in this process in September but we also wanted those who heard about it later to not feel as though they missed out and also the applicants who applied who maybe weren't successful to give them a second shot at maybe refining their grant language, replying to questions. Um, there were different factors that went into responding to this application um, because this is a new process and a new way of looking at things. We wanted to give them that opportunity again to improve and you know, change some language perhaps or provide more details and have a second shot at it. So it's, it's to get a broader reach and to also improve an application for an applicant who maybe English isn't their first language um, or they struggle with defining the information that we needed them to define. So and to add to that last, sorry, last, last question. So to that, um, it seems like we have a pool of ap applicants that didn't get it, but scored high mm -hmm. and it and they showed that they had that they could prove that they had a loss i'm not understanding why you have to apply again for the same pool of money i understand that some people may have not heard about this like that that's mm -hmm. fair but at the same time you have businesses that have shown loss mm -hmm. and they are eligible but now we're saying no never mind you have to apply again and refine your application and see if you can convince us which I feel like they already convinced us that they had a loss okay. and that they are eligible. And 
to me, it seems a little unfair that they have to reapply when we could, they could be awarded those funds. Um, and so th that's where I'm having like a little like heartburn. Yeah. Um, this, like if, if this was 2020 when we, when we gave, uh, when we funded a million dollars, we took it out out of the, emer the emergency, I don't know if you the emergency yeah. um, out of the, I think it was general fund and, and the mayor was very gracious to, you know, do that and, 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 and not everybody was aware and pandemic chaos, okay. But it's, it seems like the city has been very proactive in saying we have grants for this, we have grants for that, like, so, and we have a substantial amount of applicants, so we read, I mean, apparently the, the word did get out, so that's where I'm yeah. feeling like it might be unfair for those that sh did everything right, they have the points, they showed loss, and they're not, now they're not eligible. Yeah. Councilor Aldermos, am I understanding correctly, like your question is why did we not just award all of the $2 million since there's clearly a need for that yeah. within the applications that were, right. were already submitted and it sounds like the administration's response is that there was a, a better chance for equity if we allow people to, if we saved some for another slower process. It, and I think that's the question we're debating, right? Or If I could respond and also make sure that I'm understanding the question correctly, because, and then I, I want to look at Kathy and Jake as well, because they may have something that they could provide in addition to my comments. Um, I think Council Member uh, Valdemoros, you make a good point. Um, in terms of why is it, I, I would like to say that we can go back and look at that issue and come back with you to you with an answer, a better answer than we can provide you today. But I think that's worth considering. I think our thing has always been to ensure that individuals, or business entities, whether that's a small business, a woman-owned BIPOC, um, art businesses, that they do actually hear about this. You're absolutely right. We will continue canvassing for, num for phase two. And at the same time, I want to ensure that by just allowing the application, we're, we're being equitable to everyone else. But you raise an excellent point. And unless I haven't heard of something that maybe the, the committee has talked about in our meetings that could provide an answer, but I think we are willing to go back and look at it for phase two. Yeah, there, there is actually some recommended, so there's lessons learned, obviously, anytime you roll out something new. Um, and part of what the committee ta was tasked to do was to make recommendations for improvement of the program. And so they did that in the course of reviewing these applications. And they saw instances in the application where they wanted more detail in order to fairly judge a business. And so they've asked us to change just a couple of the questions um, so that they could get all of the detail that they felt was necessary in fairly reviewing the applicants. And so that is another positive of having a phase two is that we can apply lessons learned, um, improve the process, um, and get all of the right information we need to get in order for the committee to make an equitable decision. Um, it's not that it's... Um, extremely burdensome, I, I will add, for applicants to reapply. We aren't making them resubmit documents unless documents were the problem, like they couldn't provide proof of loss. Um, and so it's a five-minute application, and there's two additional questions um, based on what the committee has recommended that we're going to ask them to fill the information. But it also gives these um, businesses a second opportunity to guarantee that they're going to get the funding as opposed to a new applicant um, who hasn't had the benefit of having gone through the process and understanding. Um, one of the requests from the committee is that this, the, new, the applicants from phase one be required to take the technical assistance help that we offer and be given specific feedback as to why their application scored 70 or 80 as opposed to 100. Um, so they aren't disadvantaged and they probably aren't wasting their time. I think the council, or the committee was wise in recommending that they be required to take the technical assistance. 
um, and they can improve their application. It, it isn't that much of a lengthier process for them to do that. All right, there are about seven, 25 businesses that scored over 75 points, how, you know, that uh, potentially all they need to do is answer those questions to you and then most likely be funded because they already done all the work. I guess that's a question, yeah. I, I, and we kind of went over it, but, and sorry, I know Councilmember Pui, you have a question, uh, but I, I wasn't quite clear on the answer of why, what, we're, we're all looking at that average score column and saying, okay, is that the, f was that like the bottom line that you, that they considered? But it seems like there may be some columns that were considered with a higher weight than others, uh, rather than just a straight average. Is that true? Or what would account for, so you, you explained two businesses that were funded, which otherwise didn't have a high score and that was because we wanted geographic equity and districts one, one and six, six did not have any high scoring application, high, any application in the highest scoring tier. But I think what we're still struggling with, or I am, and I think it's the same thing Councilmember Valdemoros is asking, is it's not just two. So let's take out, I don't even know if it's these ones, but let's take out number 30 and 31 because, and say that those are the two mm -hmm. that were funded for geographic equity reasons, which, if we agree is valid, great. But the next score is 79, and there's way more than two applications that scored higher than 79.5. There's four. There's one, well, two, three, three no four, one. five. And then you have one, two, three, four. So I think we're just trying to understand. I think we're all looking at the average score column, and my guess is that that wasn't the like only thing that the committee looked at, but I, I'm, we're having a hard time understanding what what caused these rankings to go in this numerical order, mm -hmm. if not that average score. Does that, is that? A I, I think I understand your question, and there should be three. I'm not sure why there's a fourth, but there should be three businesses who scored higher than the the lowest average, not counting the bottom two that were carve out. So those two would have jumped up over many others because of sure. being the only ones. But there were three applicants that we, I, I don't think there were four, I, th I know for sure that there were three applicants who had um, zero under eligible funding. And so they were bumped down because of that. So they scored in the high 80s, okay. but That's they right. were not eligible to receive any funding because they couldn't prove any loss. And so that bumped them down even though they scored well above where they should have been. Okay, so it really was the average score in the end. It really was the and average score. We the didn't wait one anyone application. For any if reason. there's only three that were only only the, the business from District Six and the business from District One jumped over everybody else, and that is because of the special carve out. Two separate things pr happening. Yes. The business from District Six and One were yes jumping up, jumping ahead, uh -huh. and there were three businesses Removed that down. were just disqualified. Yeah. So yeah. that there's three of these that we should just cross out altogether. Yeah. yeah. Because and they didn't come. And I mean, normally, effect, effectively, they didn't complete their application or they didn't meet the Yes, didn't and then for the next part, and for our next, so that's another lesson learned. Um, I, ideally, we would have eliminated them from review. We were trying to be as generous as possible in understanding that, and we gave these businesses every opportunity to provide us additional information. We let them go through review by the committee, um, but typically, we would have eliminated them as incomplete or disqualified, and we we would have not even considered them, and that will be the process that we go through for the Mr. next Mr. Chair, so I, so I wanted to go from the beginning. I think it's useful for me just to clarify on these uh, things. So the, um, so this is ARPA funds. So they are meant to be, yes. you know, to help with, you know, the pandemic or the effects of the pandemic and trying to help these businesses. So they need to prove that they had had a loss mm -hmm. uh, related to the pandemic. Yes. So. What these funds are trying to bridge is some of that, those missing funds. So uh, I actually don't dislike to have a second ground. I actually think that is the right approach. Um, I think that there is more information uh, that we learn as a city, but also the, the word will get out and will more businesses. I'm hoping that in the, in the second round you have double the businesses applying. And we you hope so will. as well. I we so will. I think that that is actually the right approach. Um, and you just, you said, uh, one of you said earlier that it wouldn't, it's not that they are going to have to submit everything and start from scratch again. Uh, that's, 
is still correct, right? Like, so their application is still there. Um, so they might have to fix some things or add supplemental information to be able to make it to the second round, which I think it is adequate and it's the right approach to distribu distribute funds that are just very limited to us. That's um, correct. So I think that that is actually the right approach and is the most, uh, I don't like to use the word conservative, but is the conservative or the it's right way to use uh, <laughs> funds that come only once. Um, so they need to prove loss. They need to meet the, the criteria requested by our city um, as, uh, as that. So, okay, now I understand what all of, all, all of that part was. Now, my question, um, uh, the, the question I had originally, uh, original, like English today is a hard language to, <laughs> to speak. I, uh, I suffer that too. Uh, uh, so, the, the, my original question was related to uh, the impact that these businesses have in the city. Um, and if there is a way of quantifying this, uh, I know that this is probably for a ship sale. Uh, like, the, you know, this ship has sailed already for this. Yeah. I mean, it probably hasn't shipped. It's, it, it's not done since, you know, we haven't voted on it yet. But, um, but in the future, something that I'm interested in, and I'm not, I'm not sure that this is something that we can do right now, but I'm interested in finding out what this business is impacting the city, within the city limits. And I know that, uh, I don't know how we quantify that, and I don't know what weight we do on that, we put on that, but um, I, I was interested in some of these businesses because I was like, oh, that seems like an interesting business. Mm -hmm. I was very curious about what they did, but I was wondering, do they service two or three people here and within the city limits, and they are servicing more people outside. And I don't want to single out, I don't want to give you an example because yeah. I feel like it will be in, inappropriate. But um, so I felt like I would like to know if these businesses do a lot of their work within the city limits, just because, not, not because, it, I don't think that's a disqualifying thing, but I think I, for me it's important to know that there are invested in this city and that are trying to get you know, this, this business here. And I know they're located in our city, but many of these businesses are traveling. Uh, you know, they have food trucks or they have catering businesses. So I don't know how you quantify that, but I, I, I would just throw that out there as a thought. That's an interesting concept and maybe something that could be applied more broadly to economic development, okay. um, just like, like programs. Um, because just because a city, a business has their address in our city doesn't necessarily mean they're contributing to the economic development of this specific city as much as an, any other business that has their address in a different city, for instance. Mm -hmm. And Thank I, you for I think I'm kind of getting, English, what I'm kind of hearing from you is like, okay, how many, you have 15 employees, but like 14 of them live in Utah County and one of them lives in Salt Lake City. Is that contributing to the economic development of Salt Lake City as opposed to a business that has 10 employees and all 10 of them live in Salt Lake City or has this many of their customers are local? I don't know. I don't know how to do that either, but I think maybe figuring out how to have some metric that says what is the nexus of how local is this? Because if it's a city that's really just happens to have their address here, but they're they're doing business all over the state or the country, then maybe that's more appropriate for something that like the federal government would. Yep. I mean, there were funds. Everyone had funds for COVID. That, yeah. So it's like, how can we use ours specifically tailored to mm -hmm. things that affect our city? I, am I saying? Yes, yeah. uh, that was a wonderful translation. So of what I, I would tried to say, say one of the things that we could do in terms of that issue is definitely look at, um, since we're looking at adding probably two more questions, we can definitely come up with something that would work, that would be fair for our businesses. I also want to say that ARPA is extremely complicated. So what you've been through, we have been actually looking at all these issues for the last year. Sure. And um, in as much as it is complex, we have grabbed this all these federal guidelines and ensuring that we're following them as the funding came through the city and ensure that we're doing things right. Um, we don't want to in any way put this, the city in a, in a situation that we would have to give money back to the federal government. And so balancing this too, um, a time has been challenging. And yet I would also say that the other thing that has um, affected some of this discussion has been we do have an extremely committed um, community um, 
committee, the uh, community re uh, recovery committee, and they have had their own discussions and what is fair and what's appropriate. And wow, I I honestly, and I keep saying wow, and I've said that three times today, <laughs> but I think it reflects the thoroughness of their delivery on how they're looking at this, almost to the other extreme. You mean so, the, the fairness of the committee? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, that's what I was trying to convey. So I, I really have appreciated them, and this has been also, f for me, listening to your thoughts and your ideas, it's also been something really good for us because our goal is to do the right thing for the businesses and to ensure that we get this money out we don't have all the answers, but we definitely want to do it right. I don't know about our questions. Um, Chair. Okay, this let's, Amy. Okay, let's let Amy go because we don't know how long she'll have service. Amy, go ahead with your question. Thank you. I just, it's not really a question, but I did want to comment on um, some, the things that Ana and Alejandro talked about. <clears throat> just if we're having that high level discussion, I'm. I agree with Council Member Baldomoros. I think the work has been done. Everybody's talked about it and how diligent the committee was and how much time they spent going over these applications and and that this money has to be spent by the by the end of 2024. Um, I don't I don't know if we're going to have another opportunity to have grants like this, but I think we have if we do, we can put the lessons learned into that future one, but I would rather just say, let's take the next 25 people and give out all the $2 million. If we're talking about actually wanting to give this money out, then let's let's do that. We can also put lessons learned towards how we look at the nonprofit side of the money. But I feel like, I feel like there's this weird advantage and disadvantage mm -hmm. to a phase two for yeah both the people that didn't get funded right now and the people that maybe are new to it. And so it feels, talk about fairness, it feels a little unfair. Mm -hmm. um, whereas again, 20 hours for this, probably 20 plus hours for this ERC oh, yeah. to deliberate and go through that, that let's, let's get the money out the door. I think there's, I, I mean, completely valid arguments on both sides. Uh, let's see. He, he can go first, it's fine, and then uh, I can sorry, go. Jugen has been asking oh, me, yeah. and then okay. and then and me. Okay. Well, tomorrow's. Okay. I, I appreciate the sliding scale. I think that's a good uh, option. I think I, I like the way that's doing that because someone who wants $50,000 and a low scale and gets $50,000 for someone who gets $2,500 and that $2,500 to $2,000 difference, I mean, there's a big difference. So I think I like the sliding scale. Uh, as far as the, the minimum size grant, there's a question about that. You know, we didn't really set one here. Your lowest one was $2,500. I don't really think we could kind of set one anymore, yeah. uh, but just for future things. But uh, I appreciate that uh, we didn't have a minimum because some of those smaller ones who only need $1,000, that could be the leap that keeps them in business. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Pui. So what I hope that we are, that this is done, uh, that, we, that we learn on the next phase, if there is one, um, is that we do more equity, uh, you know, we set up some goals about finding businesses in other parts of the, of the city that we haven't found businesses. I mean, the fact that we are funding 11 businesses or, you know, the, the proposal is funding for 11 businesses in District 5, um, you know, seven in District 4, but only one in District 1, you know, and four only in District 2, uh, and only one in District 6. I mean, I feel like there is an equity issue here. Um, that we could readdress, and I think having a second round will allow us, if those applicants are not pushed back in the line, they don't have to do the work again. I don't see, yes, I, I do see that missing time as a big deal for businesses, but I also would like to see more than just a handful of businesses in District 2. I know there is more than four businesses in my district that will need this money, I know. Um, so. Um, I, that's, how, that's where I come from on, on the second, I think that is a good example of how this second round could help us um, without disadvantaging those businesses that apply, but they need a little help to get through. Mm -hmm. um, because if not, why do we create it? it why, 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 why did this city create a, you know, a standardization or created a, some sort of
sort of rubric to this, uh, you know, to give these funds when then we're not going to follow the rubric and just give this, you know, just give the money to everybody without um, addressing some of the issues. So I feel like we need to give, um, we need to stick to the to this plan. And I understand the other side too. I actually don't disagree with it completely. I I, I don't at all. But I think there is more businesses that could serve, uh, you know, they could, this money could be affecting. We just need to like, give it a little time. When, when is the second round, pl planning for the second round? We're waiting for this to be approved so we can put that out. W when will the, the, this um, stage come in for uh, the next one? Phase two, we're hoping mid-March, if everything is approved. Can I, can I ask okay. a question of maybe Ben or Cindy or Katie? The, is it within our purview as the council to say, just put $2 million out to whoever scored the highest? C could we do that? You could. So we could say that, and and the arguments may be, we believe the process that was done, and I know this is different than what you're saying, we, we believe the process that was done was good, we believe the that the word did get out enough. Um, I think another argument could be, you all, your time is very valuable, and so are the volunteers that helped score all of these, and so we there's no lack of things we need you all to be doing to support businesses and organizations. So if we were to just put it all out the door now, according to this, what feels like a pretty rigorous right. process, then we could move on to the next thing that we need you to do with the equal, with these lessons learned. I, I can see both. Mm -hmm. uh, I also can see how, um, you know, it's not a small number of dollars. It, it's a lot of money and for certain businesses it could be the difference between staying between the next payroll being made or not. Um, and so if the committee who we've entrusted with this, and I, and I, I wanna say I think I really like how we chose the committee and I, I think the makeup of the committee really matched what our intention was for who we wanted to be like in, able to decide that. So if they're saying that we don't really like this process, I, I'm putting words in their mouth, but what I'm hearing is like, we thought the process was good, but we didn't think it was perfect and we think we can do better in a second round. Mm -hmm. I, I also want, I don't want to ignore that entirely. Councilor uh, Dugan? You know, we have 10 actions at our next meeting, March 7th. We can decide on these 31, get them out the door. The application process for the, the, the people who had applied the first time as Kathy said, in five minutes, they've already done the app. They've already done all the work. So I don't think having a second round of having more applicants, maybe back to Councilman Pui's discussions about the, the equity across the whole board and the uh, anonymous uh, application process, is a great avenue to go through. We're not really delaying the extra 1.25 million for long. It's going to be done relatively quickly and we can move that move forward relatively quickly because the, the committee also has already very, uh, has experience in reviewing this. So they've already got, their, they've already got their uh, flow going and their mind going. So it, it's not going to delay us by, by doing a second tranche and having more applicants out there. Okay, so I, I'm hearing two council members say, go with the recommendation and put only this amount out and do the second round. I'm hearing two council members say, just put it all out now. Can I offer two pieces of Kathy, information that might help you weigh your decision either way? Um, one is we established an application portal, so applicants had a login they created, so their information isn't gone, it's there, and they can log back in and then just hit submit when we have a second window open. Um, so to make changes, um, add documents that they might have been missing, whatever the case would be. So that's why I mentioned it's a five minute process. The other piece of information that you should probably be aware of is that because we anticipated having a phase two, um, we've had businesses reach out to us saying, I need this program, I'm sorry I missed the deadline, I didn't know this applied to me, how do I apply? We have a list of 30 applicants, uh, potential applicants for phase two already developing that we've promised to let them know. Um, not that that changes anything for you or your decision, I just know that we already know that there are members of the community that want an, an opportunity to apply. I think Lorena, Lorena, I want to, um, I think we kind of cut you off. You were, or maybe I just wasn't listening to you when I should have been, but you were starting to say like, if we do proceed with a recommendation to a phase two, what was the timeline that that would look like? Um, 
I would say mid-March. Would be the deadline. No, we would start. Start, okay. Yeah, and we then give them a 30-day window period to ensure that we touch every, everyone that we need to ensure that we are com communicating with. Also, I think if um, we're gonna do canvassing like we did last time, uh, we literally walked in the neighborhoods and went in, gave so paper application, talked to people. We went to a lot of the districts. We'll do that again. But I also want to offer that if, if you decide to do a phase two, we would love to give you some information you can also add on your newsletter or your landing page. Right. It would be great for us so to have your help. So mid-March would be when it starts, mid-April would be when it closes, yes. and then we could potentially be looking at the decision from the committee and our next vote on the final 1.25. The end of May? End of May. Depending on the number of applicants, it's about a two-month process for the committee to review because of the number of okay, applicants. Okay, so June. So, June. so we think June. So this is like after budget mm -hmm. season. We're going to get back to this. Sure. I just one, just one additional comment on the, so that the applicants that are at the just missed the cut. You know, the, the second application process, they could tweak their application. They also could get instead of scoring 79, they score. 89, and they get an extra 10% on top of what they want. So there is a, there is a bonus for that that second process for some of them, the application process. Okay. I'm just um, I'm just throwing that out. Okay. There. So My worry right now is if we don't do a second phase, what happens with those 30 businesses that start an application or they have interest on on doing this? And right. I I think that we I would like to stick to the plan. It doesn't hurt those businesses they didn't get it this time. It, 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 by hurting, I mean, I know that waiting a few months, it might still hurt, but I think we need to give the, the, the chance to all of those new businesses and those applications to be per, better. Okay, so, mm -hmm. I'm, I never, Council Member Baltimore. Okay, thank you. I, I, I think I'm with uh, Council Member Fowler and because we think we've been through this. It does seem a little unfair that you have a lot of applicants that were in the 70s that, that have proven they have, they have lost. Like, that's the main thing. Hey, did you have any loss because of the pandemic? If the answer is yes, then you're automatically like mm -hmm. eligible. And then we have other questions, yes. and and now, and, and then, but, but the committee didn't love the questions, so they're like, ah, we're gonna, you know, rank you less, and mm -hmm. and now we're saying, well, if you, it, we're gonna ask you two more questions, and then we're also opening it up for people that missed the deadline, forgot, weren't, didn't, I don't know, the, 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 the program didn't get to them for whatever reason, even though we've done substantial canvassing. We did, we did. Uh, and now we're telling these people, like, well, you know, you might have somebody that has a better application than you, we might like their explanation better, um, so sorry. For, you know, sorry, yeah. like you did experience loss of, but we, we don't we don't like the way you applied or what you said in your application. So that's my that's my my heartburn here because sure. they've done the work. Mm -hmm. So maybe I will be I will be happy with a phase two because of the thirty that or more that might want to apply. But maybe we do give priority to the ones in the <laughs> high seventies. You know, if they answer the questions, the two new questions correctly, and it, it's of the like of the committee, because now the wording is going to be perfect, and then they have the, the information that they need, that we kind of reward those that they already went through this process, and they did apply on time, and. So reapplicants get scored more favorably. Right. In some way. In I some way. I, I, I'll, feel, I'll feel more comfortable with that, and I feel it's more fair to them. The, so is it, so I, just to clarif clarify, is the process uh, uh, where the board scores these uh, businesses, it's not just we like your, you I, know. This well, is a good question. Yeah, can you clarify how you score, because, because how do you score this different? Because it's, it's just, oh, I mean, I'm you. not purview to this, so I will help me. It's not like we like them or not, right? Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Jake. So, so the first sticking point is completeness. Um, some people just simply provided a very brief explanation, so they scored low. Um, but I think the biggest sticking point and what resulted in a recommendation for changing this is the connection to COVID. Um, a lot of people were looking forward and saying, you know, we anticipate with uh, inflation and, and supply chain issues that we're going to keep filling the pain of COVID. And it was 
the narrative was sort of looking forward and not really addressing what happened during COVID, how big of a loss was there, and describe um, you know, what some of those, those impacts were. And, and that was the thing that we just kept missing. We, we would see really thorough descriptions, but it just wasn't pointing in the right direction. And I think that was the biggest sticking point for us. Can I ask you even more specific than that? There's a column that says, some of please briefly explain your business. So to me, that sounds like the applicants gave words written down in a paragraph format of like, what does your business do? How does that get to a score of 97, 83, 100? How, how did, where does that number come from? Was it each committee member scored it one to 100 and then they combined them? So that wasn't a question that was scored unless there was some specific information given in that um, that related back to COVID. So the committee decided in a totality. So the way that the scores actually broke down is there were three narrative questions that dealt with how a business um, was impacted by COVID that was, had to do with past, present, and future. So how did they, how were they impacted in the past at the time the pandemic happened? Um, and the closures potentially happened to their business. How were they impacted? Did they communicate that in a way that was, um, you know, high scoring enough for the committee? The second weighted score was um, how was their plan for now? How are they dealing with what issues remain to their business? And that's a narrative as well. And then the third question had to do with how, based on what they've said, how does that, um, how are they dealing with that in their budget? So how are they going to allocate these funds to help them to make them whole from those past impacts? And so those were 60% of the scores were based on those questions. Now, some businesses were not great at describing how COVID affected them. So they may have said in the introduction of the business, you know, we're an entertainment business that can't be open during COVID. You know, the, we were impacted in their description. And so that was weighted for the committee. They accepted the totality of all the answers to help them determine the three narrative um, sections that were really the greatest part of the scoring. I think that I was asking a different question. Okay. <laughs> there is a column with very with different numbers in it for each business. How did that number get assigned to that business? Was it each individual committee member just scored it and it was averaged and that's the number I'm seeing here? Or was there like some computer that came up and said, you get a 92? Like, how, how did the number get to, onto this paper? We didn't have AI, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I want to make sure we're looking at the right column so we're answering correctly. Um, because I don't want to, obviously we didn't answer the right question. Yeah, I'm not. So, if well, you give I'm us a second, we can. looking at attachment three. Hey, Scott, could you put attachment three on the shared screen? This <laughs> all, all the applications, yeah. yeah I'm looking, Maybe we have AI in the house. I'm just let's kidding. Just, <laughs> let's just start with the, like, the first, number one, business number one. And could you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, Has, know. there's like one, two, three. Thank you, Scott. Eight columns plus a total, an average, and a record count, which I don't understand what that is either. But how, where does this number come from? It was, a, it was like a, the committees used their judgment to give a score to it, right? Which number or which column or all Any of, of them? them. One, Any two, column. Okay, thank so you. So basically the committee had, um, there were three main questions I that asked this. that were the highest scored. So you could say they were weighted the most. That was the, the narratives. Then they had a bunch of questions that they could score like a, a zero or a five, like how were, how did the business adequately explain this? And so they could score those. How we arrived at the average was we accumulated a total of 100 points um, based on all of the questions, and, and then we averaged that based on how many committee members actually scored, right? Because we didn't, some committee members were recused um, because they knew the business, they could, 
suss out who the business was, and so the average was different. It was doing what you were saying, right? Like, so people were scoring it, then they averaged it out. They heard enough in the description of the business that they absolutely thought that they knew who this business was. They asked to recuse okay. themselves. And so they did so, and that's why not every applicant was scored by all seven committee members. That's what the record count means. Right. Okay, that's the great. That's helpful. And then that so I think, any number I think, in there is a we, cumulative yes. of they all. Each seven. gave a number. Right. The answer okay. seems can, to can, have can, an, can yes. Can yes. We, average. I think we may need. Can we do a straw poll on? on Thank you. Go ahead. Propose a straw poll. I'm, I, I, I propose that we uh, continue with. We'll look at this one uh, on March 7th, and we go to a phase two shortly after that. As, as they have planned. So you propose that we accept the recommendation? recommendation. Accept the recommendations and have, and have a phase two, yes. I want Any discussion on that, Strapple? I want the friendly amendment of giving priority to the ones that scored in the 70s that, have, that are almost there, but we have, they have to answer two more questions that are good enough for the committee. Could I discuss? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'd like to, a discussion uh, point. Yeah, <laughs> so c could we, instead of um, just telling them to prioritize those businesses, which I think it, I mean, I would prefer that we ask you to, for a way of, uh, you know, give us an answer about how you're gonna deal with those, those applications, those applications that we're not funding. I think that is how I feel comfortable with that amendment. I just don't wanna seem unfair also um, to those 30 some, um, but I also noticing that we are concerned about those people that didn't get funded and we want to address that. So maybe ask you guys to come up with something. We, come up. we can come back or we can respond in writing, writing and fine. see if you're I'm comfortable with that. Okay, so that's my straw so, poll. Okay, so the straw poll is we, we go forward with the re recommendation with a request from this team for how they could consider whether or not the business has applied before. Or sure. are you saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that because I think, again, it goes back to the anonymity. So we'll have one more discussion to like, this is how we're going to go over that thing, but overall we're gonna do what they yes. requested. So, okay, my discussion point is I, I, I think if it were just me in a box saying what's the best process, I would agree with Councilmember Valdemoros and Councilmember Fowler that y yes, this is a lot of money, but we should just get it out the door and move on to the next thing. And the, and the process seems like it was robust enough. My, the only reason I'm gonna say yes, let's go through recommendations because I really do wanna trust the committee that we appointed. Um, I think we did a, we were deliberate in who we chose mm -hmm. for this committee. And so I don't want to take what they're telling us they would like and, and change that. So um, though out of principle, I think that just like, I would prefer to just m move the money out and get them helping the businesses move forward. Yeah. I want to respect what the, those committee members that are, most of them are, I mean, a couple of them are staff members, but most of them are volunteers that are spending their time and not getting paid to do this. I, I wanna respect what they've requested. So I'm gonna go yes. It will other council members show their feelings? Mr. Chair. Yes, Councilmember Fowler. I um I would rather if we wait on the straw poll until we get an answer to our question. Like we don't need to straw poll this today because there is this pending question out there that may or may not change how I feel about the proposal. Which is fine. Um, okay, so uh, how about, so we straw polled, and just Amy, since you, and Councilmember Fowler, there were five yeses here. Councilmember Petro is not present, and then you well, requested no. that we hold. Yeah. You're no, or a request that we hold. Um, straw polls are not binding, so maybe we do request that we get an answer to that on Tuesday. I mean, I think giving, taking the straw poll now doesn't mean that's right, the that final decision. Stone, right. So I would like the, the answer to that on March 7th. Okay. Before we, so I guess I'm requesting that this gets put back on work session so we can hear that response and then we'll vote that night. Does that sound okay? Councilmember Fowler and everyone else. The other reason why I think 
that's good is because we've been missing Councilmember Petro, and, and this seems like something that would be important to her as well. And so I, I think having just another chance to have a discussion would be good. Okay. Does that sound okay? Also, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Agreed. Sorry, one more thing. I'm almost there, by the way. Oh. But, um, We're moving to a break um, next. <laughs> what? Oh, we're not actually voting on it on March 7th, though, that, right? That's when the public hearing is. and then There's no public for hearing for this vote. item. At least we have not chosen to hold a public hearing on this because it's not required. Oh, um, that's right. Okay. So it was for so action on the 7th. we will be voting on March 7th. Yeah. That's what's planned. Okay, perfect. Okay. Obviously, we there's nothing binding that says we have to on that date. Correct. And sure. there was a public hearing as part of the budget amendment last year when you first appropriated the funds. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, I think we're good on this item then, which means we're done with item four and we're gonna move on to item five, tentative break. Thank you. All right. Um, we are, what time is it right now? Thank you. 4.55, so we you have guys. eaten up some of the time, Thank you. but I think we still take 20 minutes because we're so ahead of time. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Oh, do we have board appointees yeah. here already? Yeah. Should we do them real quick? We have two here right now. Okay, before our break, so that we don't make the board appointees sit and wait for us, which ones do we have here? So, this is just gonna be how we do it this year. We're moving all around the agenda. <laughs> Mr. Chair, it's all okay. board appointees are present. All board appoint, okay, great. Let's just do those so that we do not have to make the three board appointees yeah, wait. Uh, wait any longer. So we're moving on to items number eight, nine, and 10. Those are board appointees, two of them for the Arts, Co Arts Council and one for the Transportation Advisory Board. Let's just go in the order of the agenda and start with Jeff Driggs, who is uh, being recommended by the mayor for appointment to the Arts Council. Um, is Good that evening. you, Mr. Driggs, online? Yes. Great, so just give us a qu quick introduction, D don't need to, go into your whole history, but just what you're, why you're interested in this board, why you're willing to volunteer your time with the city and to help your community. And, um, and the council members may or may not have questions, but go ahead. Certainly, thank you. I am a development officer, a fundraiser at Westminster College, and I've been in uh, fundraising professionally in higher education my entire career. Um, I am also on the board of trustees of the Off-Broadway Theater which for 25 years operated in downtown Salt Lake City, but uh, a few years ago, uh, we lost our lease and we're now operating in Draper. But I've been involved with um, the performing arts for my entire life and uh, the Off-Broadway Theater benefited from the Salt Lake City Arts Council grants. And now, of course, they don't qualify being in Draper, but. Um, I live in Salt Lake City and I feel like it's, it's time for me to, to give back and contribute to the arts and, and provide what expertise I can from my work as a development officer. Thank you, Mr. Tricks. Council members, any questions? Okay, go Griffins. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, Jeff, you do not need to come to our formal board appointment, but your, your official um, Confirmation to the board will be during our, our uh, consent agenda tonight. Um, but no news is good news, and if you hear nothing, assume that you have been appointed. Thank you. All right, All right. thank Thanks, you very Jeff. much. Um, the next is Matthew Coles, also recommended for appointment to the Arts Council. Matthew, are you here with us virtually? I s yes. You heard the instructions, or do you? Yes. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I'd just like to, to say thank you for for your services on the council. I've lived in Salt Lake City almost all my life and I've operated a, a business in Salt Lake City for over 20 years. We do uh, design and, and web development and it's called Modelic. It first started as a graphic design business called Contact Design. So I'm often affiliated with, with artists of all types and sometimes they're clients and sometimes um, there's they are people we support or groups that we support. And so um, I heard that we had no representation on the Arts Council board from District 7 where I live. And so I thought at this time in my life, um, my boys have both graduated from college and I just have a 
eight-year-old former foster son that stays with us, so I have some time to uh, give back and hopefully help broaden uh, engagement with the arts in Salt Lake City and, and help bolster um, what the city can do to make it a, a vibrant part of our lives, which I think is important for all of us to have the arts as part of our lives. Thank you, Mr. Coles. Council members, any questions? Thank you for your willingness to serve Salt Lake City. You'll be confirmed during our consent agenda tonight. All right, thank you so much. All right, the last board appointee is Justice Marath, um, recommended for appointment to the Transportation Advisory Board. Justice, are you with us? Mr. Chair, I don't see Justin in the meeting. Okay, Justice, um, if you're able to hear us, um, I think what we'll do is we'll go to break now. If you're, since we've been changing the time up on you, I guess at any point, if you're here, we'll go to your, your appointment. Mr. Chair, Justice yeah. just oh. popped into the WebEx. Justice. Yeah, sorry, my, my internet burped on me right at the worst possible time. At the worst possible time. Okay, Justice, the, um, so you're, you've been recommended for appointment to the Transportation Advisory Board. Just give us a brief introduction to who you are and why you're interested in transportation and uh, why you're willing to spend your free time with the city. Yes, so uh, I am an Associate Professor of Psychology at Salt Lake Community College. Um, I have been in Utah on and off for about 12, 13 years now. Um, I've lived in Salt Lake for most of that time, and I've lived in Rose Park in District 1, which I hope to represent for about seven years now. Um, I am interested in being part of this board because, well, I have to get around the city myself, and I use all forms of, of transit. Uh, I prefer cycling and public transit, but I certainly walk and, and drive our city streets also. Um, I do have some experience doing this. I was on the Durango, Colorado's uh, Transit Advisory Board uh, way back in about 2005 to, and 2006. Uh, and so when I found out that uh, we needed someone to represent our district, I decided this would be a great way to, to get involved. Great. Thank you, Justice. Council members, any questions? Thank you for being willing to serve Salt Lake City on the Transportation Advisory Board. You'll be confirmed during our consent agenda tonight, but you do not need to attend in order to be confirmed. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, have a good afternoon. All right, so now we are moving to our break, after which we only have one item left, is that correct? Yes, you have that one item and then you have the possibility of a closed session. Potential closed session. And we're just confirming whether that's going to work for tonight or not. Okay, let's take a break because I need a break. And then we'll come back at, let's say, 5.20. It's 5.03 right now. Does that work? Okay, 5.20.
that was a slightly longer break, but deserved. We are moving on to item number six on our agenda, which is authorizing the execution of an interlocal agreement in order to transfer a MITS vehicle to West Valley. And Sylvia Richards, Council Policy Analyst, is online to give us an introduction to this item. And then I don't see them, maybe they're online, but Michael Fox, um, Assistant Chief of Administration, Gary Carter, Captain and Jason Oldroyd, City Senior Attorney, are theoretically available. <laughs> Go ahead, Sylvia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The fire department, uh, through a grant, received two MITS vehicles. MITS stands for Mobile Interoperable Tactical Solution Vehicles, which are used in emergencies and other operations. Um, the vehicles were owned and maintained and operated by the city, and the grant funding has been terminated, and the members of the, of the grant have now become responsible for the maintenance of those vehicles. In 2012, one was transferred to the United Fire Authority, um, the proposal, as you mentioned before the council, is whether the council would authorize the execution of an interlocal agreement to transfer the, the second vehicle to West Valley City. And I'd be happy to turn the rest of the time over for questions um, and or over to, um, uh, to Jason or um, Captain Carter, if you're interested in uh, making comments or Assistant Chief Fox. Thank you. I see Chief Lieb on there. Chief Lieb, is there anyone from your department that wants to speak to this? The council, this is Chief Fox. I'm here. I just can't get my Hi. video to work. I apologize. No worries. We can hear you. Um, um, do you, do you want to go first or should we have Jason Oldred from the attorney's office? Sure, I can wait for Jason to go. And then if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, great. Jason, why don't you give us any legal background to this issue that we may need? Sure, I'd be happy to provide just a little bit. This is a case where we've put together an interlocal agreement with West Valley City that would allow us to transfer this uh, MITS vehicle to West Valley City. They would take over the maintenance and the care of it. It's my understanding, uh, and Chief Fox can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that the city is actively using this vehicle in any way. It's just kind of sitting there. We've previously transferred a, a similar vehicle to the Unified Fire Department, and West Valley City has gone ahead and they've executed their half of the interlocal. So if we see fit to, to move forward, we could execute ours and, and make the transfer. Great. Chief Fox? Uh, Cap yeah, Chief Fox. Yeah, Jason's correct. We don't use the vehicle. We just basically maintain it every year. Um, when these were first purchased, they were bought through a grant that was a collaborative grant with Unified Fire Authority and with West Valley. Um, we did transfer one of the vehicles to Unified Fire Authority in 2012, and we've just had the other vehicle in our fleet since then. West Valley would like to take possession of it, and they would like to update all of the electronics, electronics on board and move it to a frontline apparatus for them. All right. Um, maybe I want to ask a question. What is a mobile interoperable tactical solutions vehicle? And what does that do? So that, that's a great question. What it is basically is a mobile kind of dispatch center. It is full of radio equipment and it can take and patch different radio channels together for use on big incidents. Um, we have used them over the years on some several wildland incidents throughout the valley. Um, so, okay, so it has been used. Do we have another one? Is, it, is this a surplus one? Is that why we don't use it? Or why is this of value to West Valley and not to Salt Lake City residents? The, the, all of the electronics on it are outdated, mm -hmm. and we are moving to the new radio system that will allow us to communicate a lot better with outside agencies. Um, West Valley does want to update the equipment on there and use it in their wildland program. Okay. Council members, any other questions on this? I guess we'll just trust you that this makes the most sense. <laughs> Seems like it does. Um, anything else you want to add, Chief Fox or Jason? No, I don't, I don't believe so. so. Okay, great. So um, that is not an item that needs to have a public hearing or 
public comment period or public, yeah, public hearing. So we have tentative action on this scheduled for the next meeting, March 7th. Um, and I think that moves us over to report of chair and vice chair. Um, I do have, I just wanted to, my announce, I have an announcement. Um, I wanted to just go over, I've had a lot of people ask questions about the 704 East 900 South rezone that we're voting on tonight. So I just wanted to clarify the way that I understand it because I've heard things from constituents and other council members. Um, and I wanted to just make sure that we're all on the same page as to what we're voting on. Uh, in our work session, we had talked to the property owner and they, they were amenable to a development agreement that did a couple of things. So this is an old house, but it's not a historically designated house. It's not protected in any way right now. Um, so one thing we've asked is that they would um, enter into agreement that it would be retained for the next 50 years. I think 50 years was suggested by the attorney's office as like a reasonable amount of time for a building. After that, it may be uh, cost prohibitive to continue to maintain it, or I, I think that was the suggestion. But um, the development agreement would make it protected it's not currently protected, it could be torn down. Um, there was a suggestion to ask the property owner to bring the building into code compliance. So the building is not in code compliance. It is, there's four units, it's only allowed to have two. The four, four units that were created, to my understanding, were done outside of the typical process and so there have been no safety inspections on that. So there was a suggestion by some, by I think the public and some council members to require them to be brought into code compliance before we do the rezone. And I just wanted to clarify, that isn't possible because the building department cannot give a building permit or go in and inspect a four, four unit dwelling um, when that doesn't meet zoning. So there's no way that, right now they, they cannot get a building permit to make their build, their units in compliance unless they were to go down to two units. So we would be asking them to remove two units and then we would consider allowing them to add those two units back in. So I think the decision is whether or not we want two units or four units there. Um, the proposed ordinance would also require that these be used for long-term leases, not short-term rentals. The base zoning that is being requested would allow short-term rentals, but the property owner my understanding is has been amenable to saying even though the zone we're asking for would allow it, we won't, we'll not use it for that. And that would be in perpetuity. Brian, do I have that correct? The proposed zoning for SNB or small neighborhood business would allow a bed and breakfast to be operated there provided the property was granted landmark status and that, you know, go through that process. Just under the base SNB zoning, it would not allow any type of short-term rental unless it goes through the, the landmark I see. status. Under the, but under the development agreement, the property owner has agreed that whether or not it's landmark status it's granted landmark status, it would not be used for short-term rentals. That is correct. He's agreed to not do short-term rentals. And if that's in perpetuity, like you said, so basically, he, let's say, he says, in perpetuity, I'm gonna do this agreement, but he sells a property, a new property owner says, hey, there is economic hardship with this. I could be doing short-term rentals. I'm going to challenge that decision that was made. Previously, what are the, what's the like, likelihood of the challenge like moving forward and then having the new property owner actually do have short-term leases? Or is this in the law that if we say something today in perpetuity, then it's forever and there's uh, no a challenging? A future council could remove that development agreement, right? Maybe Katie or? Can a future council remove a development A development agreement is Sorry, here. Um, a development agreement is executed by the administration. So a future council could not compel a future mayor to remove that development agreement, could it? I think that that would be 
pretty challenging also because it's a contractual agreement between the parties and yeah. uh, changing the terms of it could potentially create a breach for the city. Oh, interesting. And then okay. we could get sued. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, that would be forever then, sounds like. Uh, any other questions on that? I just wanted to clarify because I think there were some, some questions about that. So I'd um, like to clarify something on that too. On the motion, uh, the contract talks about the four units, but the motion sheet doesn't say anything about the number of units. Um, so can we put that on the motion sheet as well? That has been updated. Okay, great. Since Thanks. it was just this afternoon okay. that we put what in is, there a minimum of four units, four dwelling units. The contract talks about four units. The motion sheet doesn't say anything about the number of units, and I would like it to be in the motion. Yeah, we updated so that, that motion. This okay, afternoon. so the agreement would be that they would maintain a minimum of four dwelling units. Correct. Okay, and that's which would make it difficult for them to put commercial on there, which may be beneficial in some ways or may not. But okay, depends on who you ask. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Okay. I think that's clear to everybody, right? Is it clear to everybody? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. And then the other one is that we have pulled um, the ADU ordinance from action tonight. There was a lot of interest after the public hearing about that. Um, some council members have reconsidered some, some of the straw polls that we took previously. So we're going to put that back on work session and continue to discuss that because um, because of the, those uh, changes and because of the input that we heard at the public hearing. I just wanted to add that staff also has some follow-up work we're doing um, based on some of those ideas that were raised to, with the administration, figure out, um, especially the attorney's office, figure out what our um, options are. So staff is doing some work in the meantime also. So if you're waiting for us to see how we're going to vote on the ADU ordinance, it's not going to happen tonight, pu public. Um, and those are all my announcements. Um, next is report announcements of the executive director. No announcements. Do we have a closed session tonight? Okay, so um, councilors, I'm looking for a motion to enter into closed session for attorney client privileges and to discuss the purchase, exchange, or lease of real property. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion from Councilmember Fowler, second from Councilmember Valdemoros. Any discussion? I will roll call Councilmember Fowler. Yes. Councilmember Puy. Yes. Councilmember Wharton. Yes. Councilmember Petro. Yes. Councilmember Valdemoros. Yes. Councilmember Dugan. Yes. And I'm a yes, that passes unanimously. And we will enter closed session and we will not come back to work session. We will reconvene at 7 p.m. for our formal session. Look at you. And for those joining us on WebEx, um, stay on the same link. So we'll be in the same link once we get the recording set. If you're, if you're here for the closed session. Yes, if it's appropriate, <laughs> you stay on the link. <laughs>